Welcome to the International Women's Day North America Summit. My name is Kubra Zengin, and I'm the regional lead for Google Developer Groups and Women Tech Makers programs for the North America region at Google. Hi, everyone. My name is Karina Liu, and I'm on the North America Developer Ecosystem Team at Google, supporting the Google Developer Groups and Women Tech Maker communities. We're thrilled that you could join us to celebrate International Women's Day this year over the next two days with thriving women in tech and allies all across North America and beyond. Before we start, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. We'd love to know where you all are joining from. So as you are typing where you are joining from, I would like to touch on the importance of the International Women's Day. While celebrating this exciting day together, it's crucial to remember we are all here to empower women and work towards the equality and diversity in the world. We always say, empowered women, empower all. We hope you all can benefit from the content and talks, all focused on the theme of Courage to Create. I would like to call out that this event is, has two tracks that you can join over the two days. You will find the links shared for each track in the chat or on the website. The sessions will cover the stories, experiences, and journeys of our speakers, best practices, learnings, and discuss ways to foster diversity and inclusion in every aspect of our lives. We would like to also thank our team of committee leaders who helped put together this event. Now, Corina will take over for some housekeeping items today. I know we're all excited to get things started, but before we jump into the talks, I want to touch on a few housekeeping items. Please make sure that we're all excellent and respectful to each other. We want to continue to provide a safe environment for you to enjoy the learnings, speakers, and networking. So if for any reason you have concerns, please let us know. There's also a link that we've shared here to submit a form as needed. And just a reminder, this is an inclusive conference with a zero tolerance for any form of harassment. Feel free to share your questions for any of the speakers right in the YouTube chat. They'll be able to respond throughout the day. And our team will also be available to help if you need anything. I'd also like to mention that there is a Slack group for this event where you can join to connect, network, and continue your conversations with other participants. And of course, we always appreciate your input, so feel free to share your feedback with us. We will be wrapping off a leadership skills workshop, a mentorship session, and a Google Cloud credits, which are all up for grabs. And lastly, don't forget to use these hashtags to share your photos and memorable moments from the event on your socials. We hope you all enjoy the sessions and most importantly, have fun. Now, it's time to check out what Courage to Create means to some of our community members who were also part of this organization team for this event. So let's watch together. Courage to Create means creating opportunities for everyone to achieve their full potential. Hi, Shenli from GDG Cloud Edmonton. I'm a wildfire scientist and a women tech maker ambassador. To me, courage to create means to do what is right, not what is easy. Hi, I'm Huda. I'm a woman tech maker ambassador in Montreal. And to me, courage to create means taking the time to slow down when everything is fast and creating the space that you need for yourself to grow. Hello from GDG and women tech makers. New York City. I'm Anna. Courage to create means to go against the flow, if that's the way to go. Be brave. Believe in yourself. Help others along the way. I am Sherry Yang. I am a senior software engineer and a woman tech maker ambassador. Courage to create to me means stepping out of my comfort zone and taking action on my initiative. I'm Pocheta, I'm a cities organizer and women tech maker ambassador. Courage to create mean to me is just to be fearless of taking any challenges that trigger to accomplish my goal. Hi there, my name is Irene Roussel and I'm a women tech makers ambassador. I'm part of the Fredericton women tech makers community. When I think of what it means to have the courage to create, I think about believing in myself, taking action, and getting more women and girls like me involved in technology. 
what do you have the courage to create in 2021? Hi, I'm Nadia Taheri, Roman Techmaker Ambassador Montreal. To me, uh, courage to create uh, means to be proud of you, to create your own future, and to build a nice networking. Hi everybody, this is Natalia Silva from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I hope you're enjoying the Women Tech Makers Summit today. And for me, courage to create means being able to wake up every day and bring your best self for everybody around you. Hi, Lisa Wilms here, GDG Cloud Cincinnati and Women Tech Maker Ambassador. Courage to create means to me the courage to step outside your comfort zone and try something new that fuels your passion or shares your passion with others. Hi, I'm Nayada Shurya from Women Tech Makers San Francisco and Women Tech Makers Cloud San Francisco. I have a courage to create a world where everyone feels safe and that they belong here. Happy International Women's Day. Hi, this is Shaima Abbas from GDG Cloud Fredericton and Women Tech Maker Ambassador. This year, I have courage to support and encourage every woman in my community to achieve her dream. This year, I have courage to create a better future for my kids. Let me know what you have courage to do in 2021. All right, let's kick it off with an exciting session of the day. We are very honored to welcome our keynote speaker, Melanie Parker, who is the Chief Diversity Officer at Google. She's going to share her own journey and experiences inside and outside Google to inspire all women in tech in North America and beyond. Welcome, Melanie. Hi, I'm Melanie Parker, Google's Chief Diversity Officer. And thank you all so much for having me and welcome. I'm so excited to be kicking off International Women's Day North America Summit. And today, like every day for me, is about honoring the tremendous contributions that women continue to make to the tech industry, our special company, our society, and the world. We should all be proud of that. I want to begin our time together by thanking you all for the tremendous contributions that you continue to make to the tech industry. I know that during these trying times, showing up and working hard requires extra effort, especially for those of us who are doing double duty as caretakers in our households. And for many of us, getting it done, it's just in our DNA as women. It feels like second nature. Something that may not come as naturally to us is actually taking the time to recognize our accomplishments and honor our own needs. And a couple of weeks ago, I did something that I rarely do and something that those who work closest with me know seldom happens, something that even I was surprised by. I took a couple of days off and it was a long time coming and trust me, it was desperately needed. I needed to rest step away as much as I could, but most of all, I needed to thank myself, show gratitude to my body and my spirit, forgiving of myself as much as I do. And I actually don't say this in an arrogant way. I'm saying this in recognition of how high the expectations are for all of us and the cost to my well-being that those expectations have. And so I finally did it. I blocked out my calendar, put up an out of office message. And I told a few of my peers and leads that I would be taking those two days off. And I spent time on a Thursday and a Friday, just resting, spending time with my loved ones who are in my COVID bubble, walking my sweet dog Simba and completing a knitting project. And it was great. And a moment ago, I expressed my gratitude for your hard work. But I also want all of you to follow my lead and show yourself gratitude by prioritizing your well being, unplugging, and really honoring your needs, both big and small. And I know it's easier said than done. And I know many of you are thinking that. And I know we often feel guilty about asking busy colleagues to back us up so that we can take some well deserved time off. But if you take nothing else from our time together, know how much I value you and support you taking the time and the space that you need to really prioritize your well-being. 
Also know that these are dynamic times for our organization. And indeed, it seems that we're in the headlines daily, both positive and not so positive. And nevertheless, Google is committed to making diversity, equity, and inclusion part of everything we do, from how we build our products to how we build our workforce. We're taking concrete actions to steadily grow a more representative workforce, to launch programs that support our communities globally, and to build products that better serve all of our users. And I know this has been apparent mostly with our racial equity commitments, a body of work that we continue to push forward on. But I can also assure you that the representation and employee experiences of all women remain front and center as well. We're taking concrete actions to steadily grow a more representative workforce, to launch programs that support our communities globally, and to build products that better serve our users. And everything at Google starts with data. This lies at the heart of everything that we do. Data helps us determine how we're doing in terms of attracting and assessing talent at every step of the recruitment and the hiring processes. And since we started sharing our data in 2014, we've seen large gains for women in tech globally. In fact, our latest diversity report shows that for the second year in a row, we increased representation for women globally, and we increased representation of women in leadership roles globally. And this data is positive, but we recognize we still have a lot of work to do. And I'm excited to share that for the very first time, we've set representation goals for software engineering for SWE Women Global, a signal that we're getting more focused and more aggressive in our pursuit to creating a truly representative workforce. And in the past, we just hadn't gotten as granular in how we measure our progress. But this year and moving forward, we want to be as targeted as possible to ensure that we're being as deliberate and as strategic as we need to be. And this will require a continued but enhanced focus on our hiring and our retention efforts. So let's talk about from a hiring perspective. We're committed to building connections with women in tech from their time in college through professional careers. We conduct campus outreach at nine women's colleges. We also partner with women in computer science chapters across over 100 universities. We host over 200 events annually. And these events provide women opportunities to develop their technical skills, celebrate their achievements through programs such as I Am Remarkable workshops. They offer exposure to the tech industry. And we hosted 19 Global Women Tech Maker Summits and supported more than 300 community-led meetups to empower 25,000 women in the tech industry. We know that this work is done in partnership with others, so we engage closely with external organizations like Anita Borg, UN Women, Black Girls Code, who actually run a lab inside dedicated office space in New York City, National Center for Women and Technology, to whom we also gave dedicated office space in Boulder, and Lesbians Who Tech, and Stanford VMware Women's Leadership Innovation Lay Clayman Institute for Gender Research. These partnerships allow us to share our research, learn from others, and collaborate across industries to collectively improve the experiences for women in leadership. Google has also signed the Women's Empowerment Principles from the United Nations Women in 2019, which was developed to help organizations advance and empower women in the workplace and beyond. These principles build on our ongoing commitment to a diverse and inclusive workplace for all, as well as support for education and economic opportunity for women globally. A representation goal is also driven by how well we retain our wonderful women um, across Google. We look at representation as hiring minus attrition. And I know that there are several factors that keep us as women at a company, including how seriously our leaders and our managers take our career development. My team and I are pushing out partners to focus on developing, progressing, and retaining women at all stages of their careers. And we have dedicated programs 
to help us achieve these goals, such as Pathways to Sponsorship, Polaris, a career development program for pre-executive women, and this supports participants in thinking expansively about their careers while activating sponsorship and community to support their goals. Over 500 women have participated in this program since it began in 2017. And most recently, I was super excited to attend our Transcend, our inaugural Women of Color Summit, where I had the opportunity to interview Michelle Obama. And the summit brought thousands of women Googlers together, a huge feat that my team and I were able to bring together with the support of our Google leadership. But our commitment to women Googlers is bigger than the programs that we put on and the initiatives that we sponsor. And I'd like for you all to know that beyond all those things, we hear you and we see you. We know that as women, that we're carrying the burden of housework, child or elder care or both, in addition to the loads that we bear in the workplace. And to support parents and caregivers, we've offered 14 weeks of paid carers leave. And on April 16th, we extended our carers leave policy by eight weeks on top of the six weeks that were already in place. And this time can be taken in hourly increments to continue to support those who need to adjust their schedules. Again, I'm so excited to be here today in an event that brings together thriving women in tech and allies from all over the world. You're gonna hear keynote speakers, inspirational talks and technical content all through the lens of what it means to be a woman in tech today. We're glad you're here and hope you enjoy. And as a reminder, take care of yourself, keep leading and know that there are legions of folks behind you supporting you and cheering you on, and I'm certainly one of them.
let's welcome Sequoia and Caitlin to talk about the Women Techmakers program, the mission of this IWD campaign globally, and some other exciting news. Hi, everyone. My name is Sequoia Patrick, and I'm the global lead for Women Techmakers. Hi, everyone. I'm Caitlin Morrissey, and I lead International Women's Day for Women Techmakers. Cool. Thank you, Caitlin. So as mentioned, um, I want to give a little background on the purpose of the Women Tech Makers program and kind of where we started. So Women Tech Makers was founded in 2014, and it's dedicated to helping all women thrive in tech through community, visibility, and resources. Women Tech Makers grew from a single event at I.O. to a global program with a member base of more than 100,000 women worldwide. Our community consists of over 1,100 women tech maker ambassadors across 132 countries. These ambassadors are the North Star of our movement and we are so incredibly thankful for them. They are leaders committed to their communities using women tech maker resources to build space and visibility so that all women can thrive in tech. This community is doing so many amazing things, whether it's having events for IWD like the one today or launching a number of new initiatives to support the community, I can definitely say I'm super proud to be a part of this team. So some of those initiatives that I wanna highlight here are things like our Women's Online Safety Hackathon in partnership with Jigsaw, where the focus is to increase the status of women's safety online through training and hackathon events. We're also launching a founded podcast, or we have launched a founded podcast that follows the journeys of women tech founders across the globe where we get to learn about how they started their companies, how they secured their first round of funding and all the challenges and excitement in between. Their companies are tackling some of the world's most pressing issues, solving challenges from improving medical diagnosis through AI, using technology to helping make learning tools more inclusive. And I wanna make sure to highlight that season two of Founded is available now, and you can make sure to check it out on Google Podcasts or wherever you'd like to listen. Another cool initiative that Women Tech Makers does is a series on YouTube called Spotlight. And this series is aimed at amplifying the career journeys of women in technology across the industry, focusing on career and professional development, providing insight into their experience, advice and lessons that they learned along the way, demonstrating specific ways to jumpstart and develop your career in tech. Lastly, I would like to call out a program that recently kicked off globally called Women's Developer Academy. This initiative started in Southeast Asia and we are now expanding it globally and super excited about it. It should soon be launching in North America as well, so stay tuned. Um, Women Developer Academy is a training program for women developers and women tech maker ambassadors designed to build skills and confidence to contribute to the community through public speaking, presentations, and more. By training women with these skills, we want to create leaders in the industry that will also help to build the pipeline of Google developer experts and up-level our ambassadors. All of these programs that I've mentioned so far are built with our communities in mind. We wanted to uplift and highlight the powerful voices of women so that as we help you in your careers or maybe even in life, we continue to lift as we climb. So now I'll pass it over to Caitlin to run us through what International Women's Day is, why it's important and some of the impact of it over the years. Thanks, Sequoia. So 2021 actually marks the eighth year of the Women Tech Makers program. And it is the eighth time also that we have celebrated International Women's Day as a community. Over these past eight years, there have been hundreds of events throughout the world, reaching hundreds of thousands of people. This community that you're a part of today extends beyond the attendees of this summit and to the thousands of women and allies around the globe who are coming together to celebrate International Women's Day. And International Women's Day really is a day of celebration of all of the accomplishments of women, the legends, the trailblazers, the creators, and the connectors. And it's also a call for accelerating gender equity. For any woman in this room, it's likely that at some point in your life, you've experienced some form of bias, of discrimination, microaggressions or harassment. The current data shows us that globally, women only make up 25% of the tech industry. 
And when we look at the statistics for black women or for Latinas, the numbers in my opinion are abysmal. I hope everyone today knows and feels that we can do better as an industry. And that is really why, today, why days like today are so important. Days where we get a chance to see women take the virtual stage uh, to share their knowledge and ex expertise. We get a chance to connect with one another and understand more about where we're coming from and what our experiences have been. Coming together like this as a community helps to drive awareness of these issues. It creates more empathy and understanding and it helps to elevate the roles of women across the industry. The Women Tech Makers community is incredibly powerful. Over the past eight years, we've seen some of the most interesting, creative, and inspiring events happening around International Women's Day. Our ambassadors continue to impress us with their passion and ability to bring people together, to create space, to connect, to learn, and to inspire others. But it was right around this time last year that our community was facing a entirely new challenge, the spread of COVID-19 and the massive global shutdown. And I'll hand it back to Sequoia to talk a little bit more about what we've seen over this past year. Thanks, Caitlin. So now I wanna talk a little bit about the pandemic and in essence, how it has affected women. So we know it, been and continues to be an incredibly challenging time for women. Statistics show that women have left the labor force at a rate of four times higher than men, and experts are believing that progress towards gender equality is one of the many casualties of this pandemic. Women are also on the front lines of COVID-19 exposure, making up 67% of healthcare workers and 80% of nurses, according to a survey of 104 countries. A lot of these women are also mothers, as we know, and with worldwide school closures, it was estimated that 1.54 billion children, including 743 million girls, are staying at home. As a result, women's participation in work outside the home decreased drastically as they often take principal responsibility for children. Prior to COVID-19, it was estimated that women were doing approximately three quarters of the 16 billion hours of unpaid domestic and care work that are done each day around the world. That figure has only increased due to the pandemic as this burden continuously falls on women rather than men. I remember seeing a New York Times article that said the pandemic will take women back 10 years in the workplace and my heart just sank. While these stats can be a little disheartening, I also know that we as women are strong and resilient. And that's why community is so important so that we can lean on each other. And we are hoping that by bringing our community together for things like International Women's Day, that can be a bright spot um, for you all through some of those tougher days. And now I'll pass it back to um, Caitlin to also talk about the power of community as well as our courage to create campaign. Thanks, Sequoia. So in the face of all of this adversity, um, it's really been this community of women tech makers around the world that has continued to support and inspire one another. When in-person events were no longer a possibility for International Women's Day last year, our ambassadors pivoted and quickly learned everything they possibly could about running successful events online. Whether they were really big summits or just small virtual gatherings, this community has continued to move forward, continued to find opportunities to connect, and learn, and has continued to create, which really was the inspiration of our theme this year, Courage to Create. The challenges that Sequoia highlighted that we've all experienced and continue to face as a part of this global pandemic have ranged from isolation and loneliness to despair, grief, and loss. But I've been able to see firsthand how the power of human connection, even when it is over a screen, can really make an impact. I've attended countless virtual events where I've heard from women who are doing incredible things. I've had the chance to network virtually with women who literally live on the other side of the world and got to hear their stories, what this time has been like for them and what is getting them through all of this. 
whether it's big or small, women are out there making changes um, and creating change in this industry. And it's really important that we have a diverse group of people, diversity in gender, in experience, in background, and in location, creating in tech, because everyone's contributions are important. Everyone's voice deserves to be heard and recognized. And because it has been proven that diversity enhances products and creates better outcomes for the entire industry. So this International Women's Day, we want everyone to add their voice and share what they have the courage to create. When we share a story, it has the power to motivate others, especially those who may not see themselves represented in this industry. It could even set off a chain reaction of inspiration and creation. I also want to take a brief moment to recognize that in this past year, this may not have, we may not have had the time or energy or mental ability to create massive life altering earth shattering changes. It has been a hard year. And if that's resulted in a proliferation of creativity, that's amazing. There's no shame in that. But for some of us, sometimes just making it to the end of the day is cause enough for celebration. And that's completely okay too. We don't have to be thriving right now. We don't have to be using all of our spare time if that even exists, coming up with incredible things. Prioritizing self-care, putting your health, your well-being, your friends and family first. These are things for me that have gotten me through this past year. And what's also gotten me through this year is um, to see the value in things that might feel small. In tech, I think we can get really caught up in scale. Don't build for thousands, build for millions. And for optimization, don't waste a single second. I even caught myself thinking, oh, it's just a couple thousand views, it's nothing. I really had to teach myself to change this mindset, to take a step back and recognize that in my life, if I'm able to make a difference for one person, if I really can change something in their life, that would be meaningful to me. So it's been a healthy adjustment for me to make over this past year, a mental reframing. So that when I think about the idea of courage to create, I also allow myself to think on a smaller scale. What am I creating that can impact my direct community? How can I make a difference for just one person? And maybe that's a helpful mindset for you too. So whatever we're creating, whether it be big or small, I also wanna encourage you to share it not just for those around you, but for yourself too. When we take the time to reflect on the things that we do well, that amazing sense of pride that you get when you finish a project or when you just totally kill it during a presentation for your entire team, we're internally changing ourselves too. We're learning to take credit for the success that we experience in our life. And we start to build up a deep sense of confidence and inner strength. And as our confidence builds, we become that much more empowered to take on new challenges and to create new opportunities. Hand it over to you, Sequoia, to talk to us a little bit more about what you have the courage to create. Yes, I love that, Caitlin. I love the just, you know, what I've also tried to focus on for this year is just having a grateful heart. So all of that 1000% resonates with me. So I really do love that this year's International Women's Day is centered around the theme of courage to create. For me, courage to create means acknowledging my power as a woman and what I can bring to the table. Acknowledging my skill set and not letting imposter syndrome set in when things get tough, but more so using those tough times or setbacks or obstacles that I may face as a mechanism to launch something new and to be resilient in building something impactful. Um, so that I too can help someone and get that impact for my life as well. So now I'll take a break from talking. Um, we've, we've been doing a lot of talking and I want you to reflect for a moment. Over the past year, what have you had the courage to create? What stands out in your mind as your proudest moment? We would absolutely love for you to share. So take a moment to write it in the chat. And after you do that, Write it on a note doc that you can constantly go back to and be able to see to remind yourself or in a notebook and just make sure to say it out loud. 
be proud of your accomplishments and just know that you have a lot of women standing in your corner that you don't even know cheering you on as well. So we'll take a moment now for you to put it inside the chat because we would love to see what you have the courage to create. So I hope you're all feeling a little bit more inspired to create something in the world. Again, whether it's big, life-changing or whether it's small and deep and meaningful. Um, we're so excited that you have the rest of this summit to hear from some incredible women across the industry. And thank you so much for letting us be a little bit of uh, your experience today.
will be having parallel sessions. You can either stay on this track for a side fireside chat with Dr. Jen Walter, first woman NFL coach, and Stacy Devino, Women Tech Makers North America mentor, or head over to our second track to learn more from Magda and Jewel on having the courage to create your cloud career. If you would like to join the other track, click the link we share on the chat and enjoy the sessions. Well, I am here today with Dr. Jen Welter. She is a true pioneer. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting her a, a few years ago and just kind of kept in contact watching her amazing progress over the years. And when I talk about someone being a true pioneer, I really, really mean this. She has her PhD, so she is an actual doctor. Wow. <laughs> and then she's also a football player herself, playing in men's and women's leagues, literally leading the team. She was the first female coach in the NFL, which means she's also in video games, like Madden. <laughs> and she's even in the Hall of Fame. Like, come on. Am I missing anything, Jen? What more could I possibly tell about you? Um, you know, uh, my bag is, or my face is currently on three bags of chips. That's kind of cool. <laughs> That's amazing. Yes, I am a part of the Smile with Lays campaign. So you could pick up those chips and, and put it over your face. And I've had lots of my Gridiron Girls do it. And what was really cool to me, I think it's it's an awesome idea for you know how you can lead. Because for me, it was like, okay, well, they're the only faces on a football bag. So now we got all of these expressions on a bag with a football theme and they're all female. So, you know, you're subtly working that in there. Um, and I love that it was for Operation Smiles while the proceeds went to them too. So talk about a win, win, win. And I finally get to say I'm all that and three bags of chips. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Man, if anything, you are full of surprises and are constantly pushing, you know, whatever <laughs> new endeavor strikes your fancy. And kind of in that, uh, in being that kind of pioneering voice, what are some things that helped you find your voice? The courage to be yourself, even when it means that you're the first. <laughs> so, you know, I think that's a, I think that's a brilliant part you bring up because it is hard, right? If you go into a situation and you are the one of one, um, it's important that you don't forget who you are or why you got there because what brought you there as someone who's different and special actually is an advantage, right? And so for me, when I was going into the NFL, my dear friend, Terry Glenn, who unfortunately we lost a few years ago, um, we were coaching an indoor football together, Texas Revolution. And he said... You know, Jen, I've been thinking a lot about you going into the NFL. And the best advice I can give you is to be 100% authentic. He said, if you are the same person with those guys every day that you were here with us, they will absolutely love you. But if you're fake in any way, <sighs> they will sense it and eat you alive. And I was like, Oh, okay. Right. So at every moment when, you know, there wasn't somebody I could look at who was coaching like me or who looked like me and say, I'm going to lead like she did. Um, I held that phrase with me as like fortification to, you know, really be who I am and to yes, realize that a lot of those maybe approaches or things were going to be different. Um, but that that was not a disadvantage. It was actually why I was meant to be there. And there were definitely some funny situations where that maybe came up with um, probably the most infamous story. And I'll tell you this one because it's funny was the night before this first game, right? Like I never thought the phrase you could cut the tension with the knife was real 
until I was in the Cardinals team hotel the night before the first game when a female would take the sidelines as an NFL coach. And I swear it was like I had my own theme music, right? Like I'd walk in the room and it'd be like, bum, 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 right? Like I'm telling you, you could tell there was fear permeating through the people who would see me come in. It was like the institution of football might fundamentally collapse. And the guys were quite possibly going to come out wearing skirts, maybe tutus. Those would be even better, right? (laughs) But, you know, it was like all eyes on me. And and I was like, okay. So I went up into my room to hide because I didn't want all those eyes on me. And I hadn't even had a TV hooked up in my room because I figured it was just a distraction that I didn't need to hear what people were saying. So there I am in my room, alone with my own mind. And I'm going to say that again. How many times before a big day have any of you been alone with your own mind? And you know it races. It can be everything from so exciting, can't wait and run out on the field. And then it's like, but wait. The whole world's watching. What if I run out on the field like, and then I (laughs) play it in front of everybody, right? Like, you know, your mind can be so cruel, but it races with all of these different ideas. And I started to get kind of get myself worked up. And then I realized this was not the first time I'd felt this way. I had felt that way when I was a player. And if I had felt that way when I was a player, it meant all of my players, or at least some of them, were probably going through that same process of the realization that this is this was the dream that they'd, you know, first had when they caught a pass and said, Mama, I'm gonna play in the NFL one day. And now it was that moment. And so I got this crazy idea. I was gonna write them all notes. So I took a lift to a Hallmark store. Now, I'm I'm gonna let y'all know, as a football player, it'd been a long time since I'd been in a Hallmark store. This was not like my jam. So I'm walking down- You don't put the Christmas ornaments every year? (laughs) Nope, nope. Hadn't been in a Hallmark since I don't know when. And I'm walking down the aisles and I'm looking and I'm like, everything is really like floral and bright and glittery. And this quite possibly is the worst coaching decision that's ever been made in the history of the National Football League. I'm out of here. And so I literally started to go to the door and I heard Terry Glenn's voice. Dang it, Terry. TG, what are you doing to me? Buckeyes got eyes on me, right? And uh, I turned around. I decided I would not let Hallmark defeat me. And I found this section in Hallmark. Y'all don't understand. It's not bright. It's actually very white. It was the wedding section. And within the wedding section, I know it's amazing, right? I found these playing cards that just had an embossed heart on the front. And as the linebackers, we all said that um, as the linebackers, we were the heartbeat of the team. If you ever see me with the guys, we used to do this, which meant heartbeat. Yep. And so I bought them, I wrote heartbeat on the front and I start, you know, and I'm writing, right? Writing, writing, and writing, and writing. And you know, if you ever write notes, people like you have so much to say in the beginning, but I'm going to, I'm going to caution you guys. If you ever decide to write lots of notes, make sure that you don't start off like at a pace that you can't keep up because what I know about guys is that guys compare everything. So, you know, I was writing a lot in the beginning and then, you know, your hand starts to get tired and you're like, man, I still got a lot of people. Um, and you know, I can't write a novel in one and then be like, have a great game in another, because I know what that would play out. Like mine's bigger than yours is coach like you need more. Like, you know, I know how those locker room comparisons go. So would have been more harm than good. So I write and I write and write all night and wake up the next day and I'm still writing. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I gotta go to the game, right? And thankfully the time had passed so, so fluidly because I'd put all my attention where it needed to be, which was not on me. It was in my players. 
right? Because the measure of a good coach is actually them. And it got me out of my own head and out of my own way. And I was hoping would help them so that the voices in their heads would be mine because I knew what I would tell them. So I gather up all my notes and this is how fish out of water I was. I just realized at that point, I had never been to a stadium on game day. So as like a coach, so I didn't really know what the rules were. And if y'all had been to a stadium within the last couple of years, you know, before COVID, I'll remind you, you know, they have that clear plastic bag rule um, that, you know, you can't bring things in there. I can't see it. And it's like a size thing. And I was like, does that apply to me? I didn't know. So I didn't want them to like steal my notes. So I put them all in the clear plastic bag with the Cardinals logo on the front. And then I'm like, oh, I got to go to the stadium. Oh, I got to figure out how I'm going to get the notes to them. Right. So I see James Betcher. He's in his office. I knock on the door and he says, I said, he's like, coach, what do you need? And I said, uh, Betch, um, you know, I have some notes with players to put in their locker. And Betch says, coach, we put in the game plan on Wednesday. It's way too late for notes. I start to clutch my clear plastic bag of notes to my chest because yet again, I had the feeling that this quite possibly might've been the worst coaching decision in the history of the NFL. And I said, Betch, it's, it's not that kind of note. What do you mean, coach? <laughs> um, mm, these notes are on like leadership and you know, you don't have to be big to play big and own your huddle, things like that. And he says, huh. Ooh, I start clutching the notes even tighter. Bad decision, fight or flight in full effect. I didn't know if I should just run away, but I couldn't because I was paralyzed. And then he goes, huh. 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 That's good thinking, coach. Yeah, go ahead and have the equipment guy put them in their locker. Tell him I said it was okay. I'm out of here before he changes his mind. So I run to the stadium, and um, I don't know if you guys know what an equipment man thing looks like at the stadium, but I want you to picture a giant stadium and then a door that looks like a horse barn. You know, it has like the, the flat top to it, and then the top can open. Um, and for the players, it's like around belly button height. For me, it was like about here. So I go up to it and I knock on the door, opens. Now the Cardinals are one of the original franchise in the NFL. Uh, so they're one of the oldest teams. And this guy might've been with them from the beginning. Uh, Cause he just looked at me and you know, when you feel somebody growl, it's not auditory, but you can sense it. It's like, mm. And I like look up at him. I'm like, hi. Um, this guy did not know what to do with someone like me. Obviously, he'd never had a female before. But I know I didn't have the greatest first impression when he called me and asked me, um, coach, what size are your pants? And I said, um, what what kind of pants are you you talking about? And he was like, they're pants. And I said, well, you know, for a girl, a pant isn't a pant isn't a pant. And he said, they're pants. And you know, I had these mental images in my head, like I don't want them to come too small. I don't want to be so giant that I like drop into a linebacker stance and it's an international incident, but he wouldn't help me out on that. So when I knocked on his door that day, he was not so excited to see me, but I put the notes up and I said, can you put these notes in my linebacker's locker, please? Betch said it was okay. And I ran away. <laughs> so then I get onto the field and, you know, forget about the notes. It's like game time. And I'm, I'm out there and it's like, my heart is in my throat. A couple of the players come up and they're like, man, coach, I really appreciate those words. I'm like, oh, not the worst coaching decision in the history of NFL. We're good. And I kind of forget about it because obviously it's it's kind of a big day. 
right? Sarah Thomas and I shake hands on the sidelines, which is the first time in the history of the National Football League that handshake between a coach and a referee was two women. And I always think about that handshake as a promise that this was the beginning, right? That we were the first and we would most definitely not be the last. And it's funny, it's like, it takes so long to get up to those games and then the game flies by, right? It's like so fast, you can't even believe it. And I remember thinking, okay, we got through it. No major episodes, no tutus, no face plant. <laughs> yes. And then it happened. A reporter comes up to me. History was made tonight at University of Phoenix Field for the first time in the history of the National Football League. A female took the coat or took the sidelines as a coach. And we heard you did something very special for your players. You left notes in their locker. Would you care to comment? <laughs> no, no, I would not, actually. I thought the locker room was like Vegas. I thought this was me and you, not the rest of the world. No. And I remember being like about to get really like mad, kind of. And she said, just so you know, I, I talked to one of your players, Kevin Minter, and he said that in his entire NFL career, he had never had a coach care like that. And I just remember being like, wow. You know, and, and I tell that story, it's so hard to be different in a situation. And it's so tempting to lose yourself trying to lead like someone else or trying to show up like someone else. Um, or trying to be something different than who you are. And yet some of the magic moments are really the ones that are uniquely you, right? I went and asked Kev about it because Kev was stepping up as a captain for the first time. And, and my thing to him was like, we need you to own your huddle, right? Like, um, and I said to him, I'm like, Kev, you know, you kind of sold me out with that. Like, I thought it was just us, like special. And he goes, coach, that was special. And they needed to know. And he folded his arms at me. And I was like, well, <laughs> you did own your huddle then, right? He did it his way. And he spoke about what was important to him. And then I went to a couple of my other players and I said, you know, what did you think? Like when you saw a note in your locker and he goes, coach, I ain't touch it. I said, what? He goes, no, man, I didn't touch it. I just, I just let it ride for a few minutes till somebody else got there. And then, you know, I said to him, yo dog, you got something in your locker? He said, yeah, dog. What is it? Yo dog, I think it's a note. <laughs> said, oh, you got one too? I thought I might be cut. <laughs> <laughs> it was so out of the norm so far out of the culture to have said something personal for them there in that space in that locker room that you know they thought it might be like getting cut and it became something that was so special to them you know I have guys tell me that they still have their notes um and that was part of the bond that we created because in my mind, there's nothing more valuable than your people, right? And even though those guys wear big pads and big helmets and they look like big old robots or superheroes, they're still very real, very human men who are young and they're on the biggest platform in sports. And performance is important, but it's, it's a performer doing it. And, you know, um, performance varies from one day to the next, assuming there's no injury. The difference isn't physical, it's mental. It's something else that's going on in their life and in their world. And I think when you, you build that relationship, that's when 
you know, the coaching details become very easy um, because the personal relationship is founded on trust and love. Wow, that's really, really powerful. <laughs> really, really powerful. The power of a think- note, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, that follows straight into, you know, the tech world and the same mm-hmm. kind of consideration good coaches, good management, uh, the techniques are overlap incredibly. Um, and, and it's just amazing to hear, you know, how just being yourself, uh, kind of changed, not just you, but your environment and everyone around you and, and made things more positive. But you also said you felt pretty alone in some of those moments. And I'm kind of wondering if you could tell me about a time where you could not have felt more alone, uh, more separate, more different. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. With the Cardinals and in Arizona, it was really a great situation, right? People were excited. They were part of history. Um, From the players to the coaches, it was really a situation where like, I mean, I didn't have those bad moments. And I guess, I guess that makes it almost harder when you go into a situation that's so different, right? Because you know how good it's been. And this is, this is any of us, right? It's not just the job, it's the people that you get to see every way, every day doing the same job, right? And are they open to you? Are they responsive? Do you get along? Like, and so I went into another team situation and I get off the bus, like the team shows up on the bus and I literally am escorted by two people. Like, it was almost like I was being arrested, right? Like, they're like, oh, Coach Welter, we're here for you. And I'm like, no, don't take me away, no. No, don't put me in jail, no. <laughs> right, like, I have a fear of small spaces, no. And they literally walk me, okay? It took about, 15 to 20 minutes, just so you guys understand, they walk me past the locker room where everybody else is another 15 or 20 minutes, essentially to the other side of the stadium. And no, come on. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, oh, I have to, I have to know what's happening next. Come on. (laughs) It's just me. I'm escorted by people. They've got their walkies. Yeah. We're taking her there now. And I'm like, what is going on? Like the men in black just, got me right like I was like what this is so weird right like never had anything like this before um so um here I am and I get into this room and it's like a single changing room that I guess maybe one of the refs would normally use um it looked like it had been converted into storage because there's boxes everywhere it it I don't know if anybody had been in there in a while it's dirty And they're like, here's your separate changing quarters with the shower. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, What what am I doing in here? And they're like, well, you know, you need to shower and change. And I said, okay. So what am I supposed to change into? Because there were no clothes for me to change into there. I had been used to like, okay, I may not, like it may be hard to change. So I'm just going to wear the same pants. I don't need to strip down. I'm already good. Like I got that handled. And they're like, well, you know, your coaching uniform. And I was like, I'm in it. There's no clothes in here. There's nothing to change into. I don't need to shower. I can't stay here and help my players. It's a 15, 20 minute walk. Like we need to talk before the game. Like this, this, I I don't know what you want me to do here. And they were like, uh, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I can't do my job from here. Either I'm just going to go out in the hallway or you need to move me. Now, normally I would have just gone out to the field, but it was a torrential downpour. So it wasn't like I could just go out on the field for longer and be like, I am not even going to deal with this. And that's usually what I do. So they're like, oh, you know, the coach isn't happy. We need to find an alternative location, right? The men in black are all buzzing. And I'm like, So they moved me back over. Meanwhile, everybody's texting me, blowing on my phone. Coach, where are you? Like, we need you. Like, what are you doing? And I was like, "Mm, mm," right? So they bring me into this room, which they had apparently cleared the media people from. 
and it was a kitchen. So, you know, they, they always, put you in the kitchen. They put me in the kitchen. You know, oh, this come is, on, girl. No, it is going from the closet to the kitchen. I'm, I'm trying went to figure out the, what the stereotype is here. <laughs> I did. I went from the closet to the kitchen. And, you know, if, if none of y'all women who are in business haven't been sensitive about that statement that you know you've all heard of, like, you know, get back in the kitchen or make me a sandwich, they put me in the kitchen, physically put me in the kitchen. And I was like, Right, like I'm trying to like be like, am I being punked right now? This is all I could think is that Ashton Kutcher was gonna like jump out and be like, Coach, we got you. Like, oh man, I wish you would have jumped out because I really was like, this can't be happening. Like, do they realize they put me in the kitchen, right? <laughs> and I'm like getting tagged from my player and coach, where you at? And I'm like, I'm in the kitchen. They're like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'm in the kitchen. <laughs> they're like Co coach are you okay <laughs> right because now i sound Making like I'm sense, what's now. happening <laughs> like, right? like she got off the bus she ain't with us and now she's in the kitchen like what is going on so here i am and then i look and on the table you know there was no clothes in the other room there's clothes in the room now do you want to know what was in the room oh you got to tell me what was in this room oh you got to understand and remember it is pouring down rain okay so on my laundry loop, so it's not a mistake, right? It has my name on it. They have a white t-shirt. Wonderful and, selection for a woman. Just right, wonderful. Especially in the rain. A pair of socks. And the dude sport underwear. Right? Like the long hybrid. No, no, not a jock strap. It had it had a backing to it, but you know the like, oh. the, like it's almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So they the left me up. with a white t-shirt, some <laughs> socks, no shoes, and dude underwear in the kitchen. So <laughs> what you gonna do? Prance out like risky business over here? <laughs> right. So I just I just got so upset. Then I just decided I would honor their request and start changing. So, you know, I'm taking the jacket off. You know, I've got my, my sunglasses on, which were reflective. So nobody could see that I was bawling my eyes out underneath this. And I start changing and I hadn't thankfully gotten to any of that stuff to actually put it on. But um, my, um, my running backs coach, had been texting me. He's like, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? And I'm like, I'm in the kitchen. What do you mean you're in the kitchen? I'm not kidding you right now. He's like, stop messing with me. I was like, I'm not messing with you. I could not make this up. I am in the kitchen with some dude underwear. And he was like, hold on, I got to find you. And he comes in and he assesses the scene and he sees me starting to change. And he was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not letting it go down like this, Jen. And I was like, look, they put me in the kitchen with man panties. And he goes, I can see why this would be upsetting, but I'm not going to let you do this. I'm going to stay here. I'm not going to let you do this. Your players are asking for you. They're freaking out. Like, where are you? They're like, you need to get it together. And I was like, So it took a few minutes, calmed down, told my players that story a few times because you knew they were going to come out hitting because they had me stuck in the kitchen. Coach was stuck in the kitchen with dude underwear. And um, I even knew players on the other team and I told him what happened. He's like, oh my gosh, coach, I would have picked you up and carried you back in here. And I was like, I know, but still. And you know, I'm 5'2", so they could do that. But it ended up, you know, got through it. But I did keep the underwear. I just want you to know. And I would wear them on bad days um, under like my sweats or whatever. And it was an inside joke with my, my D lineman and I. I'd be like, look, I got my big boy panties on today. We're good, guys. And they'd be like, coach. <laughs> but you know, I think you have to have a little bit of humor in that situation that nobody should, should ever feel like that, right? Like I remember even talking to the league and telling them how bad it was. And they were like, well, you know, uh, our coaches have to do the same. And I was like, okay, just because it's a bad situation for her 
doesn't mean it's it's I'm going to be okay with it. It's a bad situation, right? Like I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm just letting you know it's not really appropriate to put a woman in the kitchen with dude underwear. Just I just want you to know that. <laughs> if you wouldn't ask it of your sister or your girlfriend, why right. you asking it of me? <laughs> right, and that that's a good point. I probably should have that been like, what would your girlfriend say if she walked into this right now? Mm-hmm. You know, but I think that humanizes things, right? Like my players were like, oh my gosh, coach, we're so sorry. Like they got it. But, you know, I think the organization just had this, this idea of boxes that they needed to check and they didn't realize that they were just making it worse and worse and worse. Like it, I understand that it, it's different and that they may not, you know, you're not able to fix a stadium if it, you know, it, it only has certain rooms in certain places or whatever it is like that. That's a set entity. But if we just had a conversation about it, we could figure it out. Um, but you have to make sure that these solutions are functional and not just making the world like way, way more difficult. But I have never f- felt so isolated as when I got escorted by the men in black to the closet, then moved to the kitchen with a white T-shirt, dude underwear and socks. I didn't even get shoes. I mean, come on. Like I was barefoot in the kitchen. Golly. I was barefoot in the kitchen. You believe that? <laughs> oh my gosh. Just the tropes write themselves. <laughs> I mean, they do. They, they do. And I couldn't make this up, right? Like at times my life has been better than fiction, but I do think there's a script in this somewhere. So, you know, just saying. <laughs> hey, anybody who's watching, she can write. She's written a number of books, throwing it out there. Hey. <laughs> well, as horrifying as that uh, experience was, And in talking about some of your previous experiences you highlighted earlier, how have you kind of found your advocates? Um, And how have they like come out to support you in places you'd never thought of? Uh, Each of these stories that you've kind of talked about, you know, you had your advocates come in and be like, no coach, we're taking this, we're, you know, we're dealing with it. And all of these things, even if you didn't ask for it, right? Uh, You were there to do a job and uh, be yourself. But uh, how have you found that support uh, or people to come support you? Yeah, you know, it's been pretty amazing because I, I really have had the insider's opportunity to see the, the best that men can be. Right. And, and I say that because you know, a lot of the times we get lost in the advancement of women, but it's like women have to do it ourselves, by ourselves, for ourselves. And it's almost like we're separate from men. Like the advancement of women obviously should include women for women, but if it's, if it's us or them, we all lose, right? Like guys and women to have the opportunity to learn how to be great together and great allies with each other. And that above most things is what I have truly found um, through coaching in men's pro football, right? Like I I got to see the best of the protector side in different situations, right? Like at that same team um, when it was tough and and the guys weren't necessarily excited to have a female on their staff. uh, We had one, one coach in particular who, I I don't know, why this was a good thing. And I know other women have gone through this, but it'd be like, if I was coaching you up on something, he would come up and say the same thing I just said, but louder. Right. Same dude. If I was saying something in a meeting, he would just interrupt me. Right. Like, and, and I kept kind of thinking at first, like maybe he's just obtuse. And then I realized he didn't do it to anybody else. Right. And it was not just once or twice. It was all the time. And it was so obvious to guys on the team that it wasn't even just my position group. It was guys like on offense, right? Like they were like, what? And I, I would like, and it got to the point where I'd be saying stuff and they'd be like, Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, you know, he, he'd come up and start saying something. They'd be like, Oh, I'm sorry. Coach was talking. Yeah. Or uh excuse me the hall of famer was speaking like we'd like to hear what she has to say or oh yeah coach jen just told me that and like they wouldn't 
confront it like in a I'm fighting you way, but they would just and they would laugh at it. They'd be like, nah, coach, don't ever. Mm -mm, we got this. Right. And I was like, OK, all right. Um, and so just having that support from them um, in big and small ways was huge because I was like that with them. And they were fiercely protective of me. And at times they were so blatant about it. I'd be like, oh, you just made my life so much more difficult. But I so love you, right? Like, it's like, you can't even help it, right? Be like, oh yeah, Coach Jen already said that. Like, what? You know, like, what are you doing? Or didn't you hear her talking, right? And and I think that that's something that that's really, you know, it's so simple and yet it can be so big, right? If you're... If, if you're in a situation and it doesn't have to be men for women, like it wasn't my situation, but anybody who's getting, you know, spoken over or not appreciated, just very simply be like, Hey, like she was speaking, right? Like Kamala Harris said, I was speaking, I am speaking. And at that moment <laughs> to me was like, Oh girl, I feel you. Right. Like I have never felt like more just like, Oh, yes, yes, please. Right. Like, and I think we've had that, that air taken out of the room many times. So be, be the woman or the man who just says like, yeah, I'm sorry. We just, just relax a second, right? Let her finish her thought, let him finish his thought. Um, and very, you know, very subtly do that. Um, there's also been times that were much more pronounced. Uh, one of my favorite moments, um, and I learned, you know, I think I did well coaching the men because I had already played with them, right? Like that situation really changed the course of my life and made me so much better at being a great teammate and really understanding, you know, the guys, right? Because I wasn't an outsider. I was an insider um, in, in every sense of the word. And so... I go and we're at training camp and we're doing something called inside run. Now it's indoor football. So you can't run out of bounds. There's no such thing. Okay. So that means you're getting hit on every play and y'all I was playing running back. Um, so that means you are getting hit on every play. It's not like a receiver where you get to run away from people. Like you are either blocking or tackling or something or blocking or getting the ball and getting tackled on every play. And Solo comes over. He was our number one right wide receiver. And he's like, little mama, don't worry about it. I got this. I said, got what? I had no idea, right? I'm just used to getting tackled every minute. I'm like, oh, probably mud all over my face and everything else. So apparently a cornerback was chirping off and he did not think a woman should be out there. And he was going to take it upon himself to correct the situation. Because if I ran his way, he was taking me out. Yep, he was gonna take me out. Take it upon himself to take me out. Well, Solo heard him. And Solo um, went to the coach and he said, Coach Dub, I need some one-on-ones right now. And he just kind of looked at him. He said, all right, Solo, go ahead. Calls the guy over and he said, listen, I forget what his name was, cornerback you are not good enough to talk smack to a girl. I'm getting you cut today. My guy kind of looks at me. He's like, come on, you and me, one-on-ones, let's go. So the guy lines up, but he lines up off man. And he looks at him, Solo looks at him, he goes, oh, big man wants to take a girl at, and now you gonna, you gonna line up off man? You ain't met me. You gonna press me. Come on. <laughs> Come on. You got full solo. Get on the hash, buddy. Get on the hash. <laughs> Get up here, right? And then he looks at the quarterback. Solo looks at the quarterback. He's like, hey, quarterback, I'm about to run a fade on this guy and score a touchdown right now. So called out the route, told him exactly what he was going to do. Oh, man. Solo goes out. And one-handed catch. Brings it down, puts it in his face, and said, You still want to talk smack to a girl? Let's go again. Several times Solo did the same kind of thing. Um, and he really set the standard that it wasn't me versus them. It was, I am a part of that group. 
And he had asked me to trust him on that because he said, you need to be a part of our locker room. He said, you know, and he had told me this the day before. He said, you're tough. I get it. And he goes, and, but you can't be separate from us, right? If you have something happen and even if you handle it, the guys are going to say, oh, they're going to throw their hands up, right? And say, oh, she's got this, right? She's separate from us. He said, but if you let me handle it as the captain, and he was, he was the leading receiver. He said, I can send the message that you're a part of us team and it's us versus them. And from that day forward, it really was a much different situation because of how he set the standard. Wow, that's incredibly powerful. Uh, I hope that you still keep uh, in contact today. Uh, of course they do. Of course. <laughs> of course. This is family. We call it football family. I have a big, wild, crazy, diverse football family, and I love it. So I know that we don't have that much time left, but I wanted to open this up for you to kind of tell us what you're doing, what are kind of the next steps in your life, and what you're really excited about, or even just where we can follow you and, and more information. Well, first, where you can follow me and more information, um, my website is jenwelter.com, and that's a welterweight like um, in boxing, um, which is the ultimate irony because, you know, welterweight's like, what, 145? So I've been punching above my weight class my whole life. Um, and then my Twitter, jwelter47. 47 was my football number. Just, you know, probably makes sense. Uh, well, 47 on Instagram, Welter 47 on LinkedIn and Dr. Jen Welter on Facebook. Um, in terms of what's up right now, you know, I think this has been a hard year for me, just like everyone else. Um, this, this pandemic is so hard and it's hard on everybody in different ways. So the first thing I want to do is for everybody listening, just know you're not alone. Um, these are hard times for everybody. And we all need to know that it is hard, even for some of the people that you would consider the strongest. And frankly, especially for some of the people that you would consider the strongest because they're not often the ones that will reach out and let you know that they're not okay. So be intentional about those connections. Take a moment if you've got it and just dial a number that it's been too long and just say, I was thinking of you and I love you um, because I know those calls pick up my day all the time and making them does as well. So even if you're feeling a little lost, Sometimes we can find ourselves in, in what we do for others. So, um, you know, I, I just ask you to find those moments and don't be afraid to ask for help um, for so many reasons. And just know that you are not alone in that um, because it is tough. Um, I mean, for me personally, the majority of my business was in-person events, um, speaking on big stages and running football camps for girls, which is one of my favorite things, which is gridiron girls. Um, and, and all of that stopped. So I think we all had to find ways to, um, to be proactive in this time, right? For me, if all of the things that I used to do went away, I just looked at what can I do that would help? And voice is something that I think I'm pretty good at right? giving voice to situations or helping other people find theirs. And so I actually created a kids book series with one of my good friends, Brooke Foley. Um, we have in this side, you know, it was a pandemic because I have four books now and, you know, having four book, four kids books out on the market in under who knows how long is, is a lot of work. So um, but we created the Critter Fitter series using critters to get kids fitter through motion and emotion. Um, 
just because I had so many friends who didn't know what to, how to talk about with their kids and there weren't tools there, right? Whether it was that they were physically bouncing off walls, which is what, you know, Busy B, um, Critter Fitter with Busy B and an adventure and movement is, or if it was, gosh, I just want to hug, which is when a ladybug can't hug, or uh, how do we get these kids to wear masks that doesn't, you know, um, masks were typically with villains. So we wrote wearing a mask says, I love you, which gives the mask a hero story and goes through all the CDC guidelines. And then the resilience um, is an ant-based adventure that kind of puts everything together um, with the connective tissue of ants. So like Brilliant is our scientist who discovers how to defeat the viruses invisibility. Um, we talk about quarantine. Uh, where you go when you need to keep more than six feet in between. We teach about antibodies um, and we have a very inclusive ant army that is led by a sergeant and lantern um, <laughs> that brings the antibodies and knowledge back to everybody so that we could, you know, hopefully return back to school, back to work and back to play. So that's been just the way that I felt like I could positively contribute to the world in a time where I think we all need to look for ways to elevate, um, shoot, elevate ourselves up off the floor and elevate others when possible. Absolutely. I think that's one of the greatest gifts uh, that you can give of yourself is to, you know, don't put it on you, right? Don't put all the pressure of everything that's going on straight on you. Find a way to turn it into something productive, uh, something giving, something helping, something connecting, uh, yeah. especially when we can't connect with each other in person. And, uh, you know, with that, I am just incredibly pleased uh, with everything that you're doing and uh, with getting the opportunity to speak with you today, Jen. Uh, it, Dr. So Jen. My pleasure. <laughs> so my pleasure. Thank you very, very much. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jen and Stacy. We were so inspired by your sharing. We will take a 15 minutes break now. It's time to stretch and move a bit. Let's welcome our instructor to help us stretch during this break. Welcome to the International Women's Day Summit 2021. My name is Coach Annie, here to lead your movement break. In our session today, we'll be breathing, moving, and thinking intentionally to kickstart our minds and bodies for today's focus. No matter where you are in your fitness journey, be proud of yourself for being willing to participate and dive into some movement with me. The intention of the session is to invite some blood flow and movement to our neck, our shoulders, our spine, and even our hips. And of course, taking a nice little break from our desk or wherever you've been doing work this past year. I like to start each session with a theme. So today the theme is the power of human connection. There's links between connecting with others, whether it's talking on the phone or online, however you connect with others in longevity of life. So whenever you're feeling love or empathy or connection, that's when there's this chemical in our brain that's released called oxytocin that reduces inflammation and actually boosts your mood. So without further ado, let's go ahead, connect a little bit and get into our move and break. So joining me in a standing or seated position, however you're feeling this moment, we're gonna start with some breathing. So putting one hand on your chest, one hand on your tummy, all right? Hands move together with the inhale and exhale. So really focusing on elongating that exhale. And breathe with your mouth open or closed. Three more here. Relaxing those shoulders. All right, last one, longest exhale. All right, 
moving now to our neck, we're going to go into neck circles. So it doesn't matter which, start, which direction you start with, but dropping that same ear to that same shoulder, thinking about your head drawing a big circle in the sky. Body is just feeling weightless here. Relaxing that jaw. Go ahead and give me one more this direction. Big circle. All right, let's go ahead, go the other direction. Same thing. Drop that ear to that shoulder. Nice big circle. Taking your time. Noticing if there's any tight spots, working around it. Last one here. All right, shake that out a little bit. We're going to move on to our shoulders now, going into shoulder circles. So starting forward, I want you to be real dramatic with it. Open up that chest as you roll those shoulders back and through. Big inhale, long exhale. Giving yourself a nice little massage here. Last one this direction. All right, let's balance that out. Go in reverse. Go back now. Open up that chest. Give me two more here. Whew. Feels good. <laughs> so moving on now to our spine. So I'm going to show this from the side. Starting from the standing position first, I'm going to tuck, roll. My knees are going to bend as I come down. I'm going to press my hand into my leg and open up to one side. Getting some rotation. Take a deep breath here. Back to center and then switch to the other side. Not forcing anything here. All right, so if you're standing, continuing to do so. If you're seated, it's the same thing. You're pressing same hand or same arm into your leg and then opening up like a book. <sighs> Getting some mobility in that middle part of our spine, which is where a lot of our movement comes from. <sighs> Go ahead and give me one more each direction. Noticing with each rep, if you're able to get a little bit more rotation. All right, awesome. So moving on now to our hips, we're going to go into a hip shift. All right, so thinking, using your imagination, if you're standing, you're going to send your hips back like you're seat sitting in a chair. All right, so send one hip back. You're going to go ahead, reach for that foot, and then drive through the heel as you come back up. All right, so alternating side to side here. You're going to sync up your breath. Inhale down. Exhale. Back up. So if you're standing, continuing to do so. If you are seated, a little bit different here. You're going to shift. So one knee comes forward. The other knee comes back. You're going to reach for that opposite foot and then come back up and then switch to the other side. So opening up this back hip. All right. Either you're standing or seated. Same thing here. Mobilizing that hip a little bit. This is a great way, if you're going for a walk or a run and you're just feeling really tight in your hips, this is a great way to open up. All right, give yourself a little bit more mo mobility. <sighs> Go ahead and give me one more each side. <sighs> Last one here. <sighs> All right, beautiful. Last thing we're going to do for the day, some cactus arms. All right, so really opening up that chest, relaxing that neck just a little bit more. Meet me with your hands down to your sides. Give me a big inhale up. Grab those imaginary ropes and then exhale. Bring those fists to your shoulders. All right, give me three more here. Inhale up. Exhale down. Elongate that exhale. 
bring it up and down last one here inhale up and exhale down all right awesome go ahead make your way back to your seat or your desk all right i hope this movement break has your mind and body prepped let's go ahead go down to our neck going to some yeses nos and i don't know so starting off with some yeses here going up and down not forcing anything just let your body feel weightless breathing it out Go ahead and give me one more here. Let's go into some nose next. All right, again, going within your range of motion, not forcing anything. Noticing if one side's a little tighter than the other. You can always hold it and breathe into it. One more each side. All right, last piece here, I don't know. So dropping same ear to same shoulder, side to side here. Trying not to shrug up your shoulder, but uh, meeting your head to your shoulder instead. Let's go do one more each side. All right, so if you're standing, keep going into those tuck and rolls. For those who are seated, it's the same idea, but if you wanna keep your legs there to lead as some guidance for your chest, or if you wanna bring your legs apart so you can go a little bit further down, that's up to you, but tucking, rolling, allowing those arms just to be weightless, and then roll back up here. Tuck and roll one vertebrae at a time. Go ahead and give me three more here. Going at your own pace. <sighs> All right, last one here. Whew, beautiful. So, Few more moves here. Marches are next. So I'm gonna show from standing first. All right, it's very similar for seated, but showing from the side, thinking pushing one foot into the ground, pulling with the other, bringing that knee up to hip level, and then coming back down. All right, for those of you who are seated, same idea here, pushing through the ground, pulling the other knee up to hip level, all right? Opposite arm, opposite leg here. <sighs> Feeling that stretch in your hip flexor, especially as you come up and then lower back down. <sighs> you can live here for a moment at the top if you'd like, get a little extra stretch in. <sighs> Go ahead and give me one more each side. <sighs> Last one here. All right, beautiful. So last moon for the day, we're gonna go into some cactus arms, opening up that chest a little bit, relaxing that neck even more. All right, so joining me with your hands to your sides, give me a big inhale up. Once those arms are up over your head, pretend you're pulling down imaginary ropes as you exhale. Long exhale. Three more here, inhale up. Exhale down. Bring it up again. And down. Last one here. Longest exhale. And down. All right. Awesome. Making your way back to your seats. All right. And back to your desks. I hope this movement break has your mind and body prepped to take on the day. 
Remember that you can use these moves daily whenever you just need to take a nice little break or just need to regain some focus and attention. If you like this and you're looking for more movement in your day, I invite you to check out go slash HMP at home for all of your health and wellness needs. Thank you so much for coming in. I hope you enjoyed it just as much as I did. Have a great rest of your day. Bye for now.
Hope you all enjoyed your break. Welcome back. Now we will have Priyanka Vargadia share the basic concepts in cloud and resources to help you start your cloud journey. Hi, I'm Priyanka Vargadia, a developer advocate at Google Cloud. And today the topic of my talk is Google Cloud for beginners. As we know, the theme for this year's conference is courage to create. And um, so I wanted to take that further and just say um, my presentation is about courage to create applications in the cloud. And so today is going to be all about summarizing what Google Cloud is for beginners. So if you're new to it, you'll get to know uh, what are the different pieces and components and, and things that you can try. And then um, I'll be explaining various things available in Google Cloud. And I'll also provide resources to begin uh, your cloud journey. Okay, so from there, we are going to talk about some topics. These are some uh, high level topics that I will touch on, uh, starting from the global network, infrastructure, databases, analytics, machine learning, developer tools, and security. Although this is, uh, these are really high level topics and there's a lot more that can be talked about. And in the 45 minutes that we have, we'll only be able to scratch the surface. So um, get ready to get started. Now, here we have global network. Now, the global network that Google Cloud has is in 200 plus countries and territories, and there are 24 regions, and each region um, has these servers. So regions are basically locations where there, where there's Google's data centers. And each region has about three zones. And zones are really for higher availability. So say if one zone was to go down, the others um, can still keep your traffic going. And that's kind of the the uh, that's kind of the reason why uh, you have multiple availability and high availability. Um, so that's kind of the global network. There's a lot more to it. So here's the reason um, why this bi-directional bandwidth that we support. Um, so to give you an idea of how much bi-directional bandwidth one data center supports, you have it on the screen in green. Um, the entire internet has 200 terabytes per second of bi-directional bandwidth. And one single Google's data center has 1300 terabytes per second of bi-directional bandwidth. So you can imagine um, how important bandwidth is and um, and how uh, important it's how, how much importance it's given um, in order to uh, to move traffic from one location to another uh, and you run when you run your services in the cloud. Um, and for those reasons, you also see there's undersea cables that are being laid out to run a private network through which um, all this traffic goes through. You're seeing on the top right, that's one of my favorite pictures where uh, this cable that's under the sea is getting tested for um, a shark attack. <laughs> so it's not just uh, it's, it's not just normal security attacks. Uh, it's also being tested for uh, you know physical threats and physical attacks such as sharks. There are reasons why network is so important. Um, now, when you're using any other cloud provider's network, uh, you use something called a hot potato networking, where, uh, you, where the traffic, they're trying to, as soon as they get the traffic, they are trying to push it off their hands, just like a hot potato, right? I don't want to keep it. I'll push it off to somebody else and it just keeps going. So it bounces around the network before it reaches the user, which as you can imagine, could be could cause latencies. It could also be a security, um, security threat. Um, so uh, what Google does is in our network, we keep the traffic uh, so we follow what is called as cold potato networking. So we keep the traffic for as long as uh, we can, which is um, going through all these C cables, which are uh, our private network, um, and up to the point where it's closest to the user. That's when it gets handed off to the nearest ISP in the user's city or the state, closest to them, and then it gets to the user. It's very important because um, it, it guarantees a certain level of security. It guarantees a certain level of, uh, of network latency reduction. Um, so that's why network is really important. Now, now that the network is out of the way, which is one of the most important pieces, um, 
there is we are going to look at some of the services. And so building an application with Google Cloud services, um, if we, we'll, the first thing we're going to try and do is understand an application in general. And then we are going to replace the components of that application with Google Cloud tools and services. So you get an idea of where to use what. Now consider um, a user that is uh, trying to access your site and your website uh, or your web application is foo.com. Now this is the user is trying to access it. Now the first thing that you have to do is to create um, a web server for this so that and you're writing this code and this is where that user who's requesting foo.com um, would would grab would use the code from right now the, before it can even get to that server, the request has to first understand how to get to that server. So you've written the code, the users uh, users trying to get to it. Now, how, do, how does that happen? So they type foo.com in their browser and they click on enter. The thing that happens from there is the foo.com um, goes to the DNS server and, and tries to get translated into an IP address because um, once you have the IP address, that's when you can then, you need somebody's address to get to their house, right? That's kind of what's happening here. So you get the IP address, the DNS is responsible for giving you the address to somebody's house. Uh, and in this case, that, that somebody is foo.com, and then you're getting the address, which is the IP address. Now, once I have the address as a browser, I have the address, and now I'm going to uh, call that web server where, um, me as the developer has written some code to serve that website. So that's a very simple scenario that's happening here. Now, as you expand that further, you have some business logic that you wanna to add to this application. You say you want to add payments, so there'd be a payment server, there might be some authentication happening. So as you start to add more and more business logic, um, you might need an application server, and that's what I've added here, um, and to expand the functionality. And then eventually you want to have a connection to a database where you would save the data related to the users or your inventory or uh, things like that. So you need some sort of a database. So that's kind of how a normal application works. You need a web server, some sort of an application server where you run business logic and then a database. Now, as your, as your traffic grows, you want to expand these servers because one of these would not be enough. Say you start to get hundreds and hundreds of people, your site becomes really popular, foo.com is a popular website. Um, the best way uh, to deal with that is to scale your service. Now, there are two ways to scale. The one is vertical scaling, where you just expand the size of the server, which means you expand the memory and the CPU that's allocated to that server, which is called vertical scaling. Um, and then the other is horizontal scaling, which is where you add more servers to the uh, to the equation, which is what I've done here on screen, where you have instead of one server, now you have three. And as your traffic grows more, you can start to add more um, servers. And that's kind of, um, and horizontal scaling is, is um, much more recommended because with vertical scaling, you do reach that threshold limit. And after which it's like, you can't really add more memory and CPU to it. You would have to really expand. So uh, that's one of the reasons. And then also it's not very reliable if you do vertical scaling because you'd still be stuck with one server and if that goes down, your site is unreachable. So that's also why horizontal scaling is, is uh, much more prevalent and recommended in an architecture like this. Now, say we have all of this set up, we have, um, we are in a happy state, we have lots of users coming in, we have expanded our web servers so it can, so it has, it can take traffic. But before, and before the traffic can reach to these servers, um, how is, how is, a request going to get transferred, translated to, okay, I need to send it to one of these three servers. Which one do I send it to? That's the task that's done by a load balancer. A load balancer um, takes the traffic coming from food com coming for foo.com, and then it uh, there are different algorithms in which you can set up the load balancer. It could be round robin, so it gives the sends the request to one, then it sends to another, then it sends to another uh, web server. Uh, there could also be other algorithms, like if the traffic's coming from a 
from this part of the world, send it to this web server. If, if it's for this application slash this path, send it to this web server. So you could do a lot of different things at the load balancer to send the traffic to the right um, web servers that you would want to send them to. Or you could just keep it generic and like send it to in a round robin fashion to from one to another, depending on whichever one's busy. You could have algorithms to, to do um, to check for which one, which of these servers is more uh, busy or has uh, reached 70% of the CPU capacity. If they did, then send it to another one. So there's lots of algorithms that, that are available for load balancers that decide which where to send the traffic. And you do the same at the application server level, but it's more of an internal load balancer than an external load balancer. And then you have relational... Now, from the database, I've split them into two as relational and non-relational databases. Um, as you might already are aware, I have, um, I'm have. i going to go very briefly into, um, there could be different use cases for when you use a relational database or you have two, that's one, a, a few use cases fit relational and a few use cases fit non-relational databases. Um, in general, if you have transaction processing going on, you're probably going to be using relational databases. They have predefined schemas, it's structured data, and you you fill your data into a table-based format. And then um, it's from the non-relational perspective, if you're if you're doing if you're dealing with large amount of data, uh, say for analytics processing, um, which is usually called OLAP type databases or dynamics. They, if you're looking for a dynamic schema, you're not looking for a predefined schema um, with like, here's how my table would look and these are my, my columns. Uh, if you don't want to define that, if your data is going to expand and grow, um, then you're probably better using a dynamic schema, um, in which case non-relational databases are great. Um, they're usually better for unstructured data and there are uh, different types of non-relational databases, document-based, key value-based, graph-based, wide columns. So, um, and, and we'll, we'll see some of them later as well. Now, the one of the important parts of these is vertical scaling and horizontal scaling. Now, re relational databases um, scale only vertically. So there's only a certain amount of scale that you can, you can get with relational databases. And non-relational databases can scale horizontally. So it's much easier and faster to scale them. Now, there are ways to scale relational databases uh, that I will not go into, but um, but those are kind of like the basics of uh, how you decide between a relational and non-relational database. And say you've decided that you have a few relational, non-relational databases. Now, for relational databases, like I mentioned, it's um, it because they, they rely on vertical scaling, you might want to use a cache and not fill up your not not um, uh, not go uh, dip into your relational database for every single query. If you have a common frequent query, then you might want to have a database cache, and that would help you not um, put too much load on your on your relational database. So that's where you would use things like memcached or Redis to cache the queries, most frequent queries, into a, a DB cache. Uh, so that's another component that you might use. Now, if you have media files on your web server, files or videos and those types of things, then you might want to, you don't probably want to send, save them or store them on the disk in the server because that's not good use of that disk. That disk is more should be more used for processing um, for the requests coming in. And so you want to save the media files in an external storage. The external storage um, could be anywhere outside of that web server. So let's assume you have an external storage that you're using for these media files. Um, and because I need more space, I just scooched things over on the left here. Um, and let's say now there's not just one user, but there are more users coming in from different parts of the world trying to access the, the, your application. Now, the, the thing that, the, uh, that arises now is if they're asking for the same file, then you don't want to go back and dip into the server and get the same file every time because that's unnecessary load on your web server. So what you want to do is use a content delivery network in the middle um, so it reduces latency, the file um, 
that dog file that you see there or the cat file image file that you see there is distributed across across the content delivery network so it can be accessed from the users users uh, closer to wherever the user is and that's kind of the purpose um, of a CDN. It reduces latency. It reduces load on for, latency. Reduces latency for the user and reduces load on the servers for for your application. So, say you have a CDN to to support that use case, and that then dips into a, your external storage to to make sure that um, things that are not in the in the cache in CDN um, can can send the request to the storage, grab that that file, and then serve it to the user. Now, there's more things that um, that you can do with the data um, here. So if there's uh, storage, external storage has batch data, uh, you can use that for analytics. So you'd ingest that into your data warehousing system. And the way you do that is there, assume another use case where it's not just batch, but there's also real-time data that you're getting from your web server. Imagine a use case for uh, click stream data. You want to analyze the clicks. You want to analyze. Um, how many people are clicking on certain things on your website. That's just one use case, but there could be more real-time data coming in. You might have sensors that are sending real-time data. So imagine some certain real-time data scenario where data is coming in real-time. So you'd ingest that data using some tool, queuing maybe, and then you'd process that data, enrich it to reduce, remove commas and, and spaces and things that you want to remove or adjust the data so it's useful for uh, to be saved now in data warehousing system. Um, and then your uh, databases would also create um, a copy of, of uh, or a dump of their data into the data warehousing system. So now data warehousing becomes your place. Data warehouse becomes that place where all of your data from all of the different places, real time, batch, your database dumps are all in there for your data analytics team to analyze that data, to create dashboards off of it, to do machine learning on top of it. Um, and you could also directly send your storage data into machine learning platforms um, to do that. Now, the one thing that we didn't talk about, which is if the users are coming in from mobile devices uh, or different formats of devices require different formats of images and videos and uh, different sizes. So you might want to do that on the fly, for example. And, the, and say you have this, the, this use case, you create a simple piece of code, a function that responds back with uh, a diff, uh, uh, an image for file that is required for phones, um, a phone system. And you you for, change the format of that image and then store it back into your external storage so it can be served to the user. Um, so that's just one example, but there could be other things that you're doing on the fly that could just happen on the side and doesn't have to be on a web server or an app server because you know it doesn't require to be there. Um, the other thing that you might want to do in this application is send, send the users a notification or a message or an email when a certain thing happens. Say your order is processed and you send a notification. You, you put those things in a queue because they don't need to happen right away, uh, but they still need to happen. So they could be sent to a queue from where it can be sent to, to the users. Um, so that's kind of like an overall, uh, a very high level application. Um, and then all of that stuff goes into a private network. So it's not accessible um, by other things except for the port AD, which is where your application lives. The, everything inside is, is more secure and just it, it is, is secure and in the private network and can talk to each other. Now, oh, you also need monitoring. You want to monitor all of these systems. Are they up? Are they alive? Are they talking to each other or not? And you also need to have security so that things that are not supposed to, to be externally exposed, for example, your databases are not externally exposed. Things that are supposed to talk to each other, say the web server and app server are supposed to talk to each other, so you need to make sure that they have access to each other. Also, they don't have access to other things except for the database that they are talking to and except for the web server that this app server is talking to. So um, keeping all of that secure and safe and knowing all about it is important as well. So monitoring security and having all of this in a private network. 
Now, the first thing, now, now we're going to start to translate this into Google Cloud World. So the first thing that you would do is instead of that private network, a uh, translation of that would be a VPC or a virtual private cloud within Google Cloud. So when you create an account um, and you create a project, inside the project, you'd create virtual private cloud or VPC in which you will create all of these components um, as as you develop your application and as we develop our application further down in this presentation. So the next thing we are going to do is, let's see what happens to our web server. The web server can uh, is basically infrastructure components. So we can have a virtual, we can have, we have five different options here and there are more, but um, these are your overall five options. If uh, a compute engine, Kubernetes engine, Cloud Run, App Engine, and Cloud Functions. Now, when would you use which one, right? Um, if you're just bringing an application and you require a VM, a virtual machine, you want to use Compute Engine. It gives you a lot more control. Um, you, you can access the specific kernel and OS. And if you need licensing terms, like for example, you have a Windows server that you want to use, you probably want to use Compute Engine. Um, you're migrating an existing system into cloud, that in those situations also, Compute Engine is a better choice. Um, you just get a lot more control with it. Kubernetes Engine, if you are containerizing your applications, then Kubernetes Engine is a great choice. It is also used for hybrid and multi-cloud deployments. If you have a part of your application in Google Cloud and parts in other clouds or on-premise, Kubernetes Engine uh, would be great because you can, you can uh, use the application in uh, in different places because it's based on an open source uh, framework. Cloud Run is also for containers. Um, it's events, it's for events, so HTTP requests. It's also, it, it does stateless, it's good for stateless services. So if you're creating microservices based architecture, I would use Cloud Run. It's for specific runtimes and it scales to high and, and low traffic uh, very easily. You don't have to do anything for it. You just deploy the application as Cloud Run. And, uh, and if your traffic grows, it automatically spins up more containers behind the scenes. You don't even have to know about it. It's a serverless platform. App Engine is for, if you're building a full-fledged web-based application, uh, it comes with hosting. All you do is just put the code in and, um, and it gives you all the features of, uh, of deploying, hosting, and running a stateful application. You can also do stateless services with it, but um, but if you are doing, uh, if you are building a website, uh, I would pick App Engine because it comes with uh, hosted um, and you can run stateful applications with it. Cloud Functions, if you're just running a function, if you're just requiring that one little thing that needs to happen, the, the image example that I gave where we want to change the size of the image, I would use Cloud Function for that use case. So um, given you have this high level overview of when to use what, um, you could also use all of these in combination with each other. So how you can have uh, a, a part of your app on, on Compute Engine and the other part on Cloud Run. And then same thing you would do for app servers. Um, you would pick one of, the, one of the ones that work for you, Compute Engine, GKE, App Engine, or Cloud Run. Or uh, if you have different services, say I was talking about payment services. Payment service, say, is on Cloud Run, while the authentication service is on GKE. You, you can send the web server to payment service on Cloud Run and authentication service on GKE. So it depends on how your application is set up, but that, those are your options to do that. Now, as we move forward, um, our load balancer, uh, there is global load balancing, which allows you uh, in, in Google, which is um, which I'm going to go to the next slide here. It, this is a lot. You don't have to read this. I'm only bringing it up because to, to highlight some of the components here. It's fully distributed software. Uh, defined networking, so um, SDN. If you haven't heard of it, it's basically software defined in your uh, networking. So it's uh, it, it allows millions of queries per second, um, and it's the, the biggest part of it is it is a, it, it, you use single global Anycast IP address. So um, when we say that this 64.202.189.170 is the IP address, that's kind that's the IP address for your for all of your servers, and it can live behind that global load balancer. Um, so that's what I mean by any cast IP. And there's a lot more things that you can do with it, which I'm not going to go into, but you can pause on this slide to know more. 
Now, the next thing we do is um, the cloud CDN. So we replace the content delivery network with cloud CDN. And the way you do that in Google Cloud is by just enabling um, cloud CDN option from the global load balancing. And all you do is just enable that and set up how you want, what are the things you want to cache and don't cache. And that's pretty much it. And you have that set up. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is storage. So we replace the storage with Google Cloud Storage, which is GCS. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's basically a storage where you can define um, how you want to access. There are four different options. Um, so if you're using it in this particular application, you would use um, the option that allows you to um, to access frequently. Um, you pay a little bit more for frequent access, but that's kind of the storage that you want here. Um, there's also options for archiving um, and storing longer term, near term in, in uh, cold line or archive options, um, which is where the cost is much less. Um, but for applications like this, which are more real time and web applications, you would use a, a more real time option, a more frequent access option. And then we come to our uh, DB cache, which in Google Cloud's case, it's called Memory Store. It's managed Redis and um, mem memcache D. Um, so again, does the same thing that we talked about, which is caching um, for relational databases. Now let's focus a little bit on relational and non-relational databases. There's a lot to unpack here. I'm not going to go into full details, but relational and non-relational databases, uh, there are a few options. So in relational, we'll focus on the blue and the green here. The relational options, there are two. There's Cloud SQL and Cloud Spanner. The Cloud SQL option is for um, any typical web framework application um, so if you have a man MySQL, PostgreSQL, or SQL Server requirement, um, you can get managed version of that in Google Cloud. So you don't have to manage like the replicas of it or, um, you know, rotations and those types of things for, for database. Um, and Google Cloud behind the scenes, Cloud SQL is going to do that for you. So all you do is just set up your MySQL instance and, and there it is. Uh, so it's basically managed. Uh, you'd use it for normal, typical web applications, SaaS applications, e-commerce, web, those types of things. Now, Cloud Spanner is a more scalable version of, um, of a relational database. So normally, like I said, relational databases are harder to scale. Uh, Cloud Spanner is a much, much, much scalable version, um, which comes with high availability and a large number of transactions that you can do read and write transactions um, in a typical uh, database, much larger. And if, if you have data that's more than 10 terabytes, then you definitely need to look at Cloud Spanner um, from the relational database perspective. All right, and if you have global use cases um, for supply chain, inventory management, financial ledgers, and those types of gaming, uh, you're probably looking into Cloud Spanner because you have more reads and writes happening in that relational database, which is not typically possible in a, in, um, a, a standard MySQL, Cloud SQL environment. Okay, so non-relational databases, I'm going to talk about three. Firestore and Firebase Realtime are both good for mobile um, use cases, hierarchical web use cases. Um, Firestore is much more scalable um, because it has a different schema. Um, and they're both document-based storages, but Firestore is a much is much more scalable um, uh, than a Firebase. It Firebase Realtime, which is JSON-based schema, and Firestore is um, is collections and documents-based schema. So depending on what your application needs, uh, if it needs a lot more scalability, then you probably want to use Firestore uh, over Firebase. But they're both good for. Uh, for mobile and web applications. Now, Cloud Bigtable is uh, is a key value store. It's a it's cloud native, NoSQL. It's a wide column store for really large scale but low latency workloads. So um, things that require heavy reads and writes and events, uh, more personalizations required. Um, situations like ad tech recommendations engine. That's where you would you would want to use or look into Cloud Bigtable. So it's for time series data and those types of things, Bigtable is perfect for that. Um, 
Okay, so those are those are our two uh, different options. So let's look at relational database. We just talked about Cloud SQL or Spanner. Depending on how big or how scale scalable we want this application to be, we would use either Spanner or Cloud SQL. And then from non-relational perspective, you have three options, Firestore, Real-Time, Firebase, um, and also Bigtable. So depending on how scalable we want, again, for this, uh, we might either use Bigtable um, or Firestore if it's a web, mobile, simple application. Uh, and then let's look at the queue. The queue is really nothing but a messaging service. You want something to be in the queue. Um, for that, we use PubSub. PubSub, uh, again, you can pause on this site and, and read more, but I'm just going to focus on what PubSub is, which is an event-driven synchronous messaging service. So uh, you can use it for multiple different reasons. Here in this use case, we said it, we are going to use it for notifications. So here in this use case, we are going to use it for notifications, but in general, you can use it for streaming analytics um, in lots of different use cases. So if you, as long as you have a publishing application, and a subscriber application that wants to receive those messages, they can, they, you can use PubSub to save the message in a message store through a topic and then um, send that topic to the subscriber. Subscriber retrieves that topic, sends an acknowledgement, and then that message is gone. That's how messaging queue works in general. And that's what, that's what PubSub does. Now, in this case, we are going to use PubSub for the queue to send notifications. We can also use PubSub for real-time ingestion of the data. So I'm going to replace that with uh, for real-time in ingestion as well. So you get the data real-time either through a sensor or an IoT device or from your application, in, in this case, as clickstream data. Um, so you get all that real-time data into the system, send it to... All right, send it to a downstream system for processing and an analysis. Now here, here's how a typical data analytics pipeline works, right? I'm just taking a little detour here. A typical data analytics pipeline takes, captures the information, which is ingests the data. We just talked about Cloud PubSub for real-time ingestion. There are other options as well. You could use Cloud IoT Core for to get data from an IoT device directly. Um, you could transfer data from cloud storage through a storage transfer service from another cloud into the into cloud storage. You could also transfer data through BigQuery and get a, through a data transfer service that BigQuery offers. Um, so once you've got the data into one of the systems using any of those options, then you process that data. And processing could be a lot of different things. You can do, um, you can use cl a cloud data flow, or if you are a Hadoop or Spark user, then managed Hadoop option, which is called cloud data proc, uh, you could use that. It, it basically makes it faster to, uh, to enable a Hadoop cluster and start analyzing. So taking away all the management and infrastructure out of it, and you are just analyzing the data and processing that data um, versus spending time in, in the infrastructure. Data prep is basically a um, cloud data flow is Apache Beam um, and Apache, the managed Apache Beam. And then cloud data prep is basically a graphical user interface layer on top of it. So if you're, uh, if you're not interested in coding in data flow, um, you could use cloud data prep to visually um, tree, process your data and clean it up for downstream systems. And for storage, you have two options, which is where it becomes a data lake or a data warehouse, which is where all your, your data is going in. So cloud storage, um, you can use that as a, as, as a lake uh, from where you can analyze the data, or you could use BigQuery, which is a cloud native, highly scalable serverless data warehouse. So all you do is store data in it, and then from there you can start processing. You write SQL queries to analyze that data um, and find out what's happening with that data and to make decisions. You can also do machine learning within BigQuery, or you can uh, your machine learning systems. Uh, in this case, where I have in use. Can, can take data from BigQuery or cloud storage um, from your data lake or data warehouse, and then utilize it for machine learning. That's a very high level overview. There can be an entire presentation on that, but I just wanted to give you a, a little overview, but you can pause and, and look at that, that picture uh, in details. Now, so we got into data flow, but if you have, um, if you want to go into details, there's also a data flow diagram, and then there's also data proc diagram, which is really essentially 
um, Hadoop or Spark clusters that are managed in nature. Um, and all you have to do is store your data in Google Cloud Storage. And then from there, uh, change the file path from HDFS to, to GS. And then that's it. You're ready to go and do it, your analysis in your Hadoop clusters if you use Dataprop. Then we come to the, the stage where you have done data warehousing through BigQuery. Um, and I've talked about BigQuery a lot, so I'm not going to do that. But you basically ingest to analyze your data and visualize your data within BigQuery. Um, there's lots of interesting options from pricing perspective because you can store data, so you can use it as a storage and your analytics platform. So you can, it can be the one tool that does three different things for you in the in 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 the data analytics uh, pipeline: store, analyze, and also do machine learning and things on that. Then you can do dashboarding. The free tool here is Data Studio, but there's also other tools that BigQuery can connect to, like external tools like Tableau and other places. Um, so there, there's third-party connectors to them. Uh, and then you can do um, AI on top of it. Now for AI, there's a lot that, can, that you can do. So I'm not going to go into too much details of that um, because uh, for the in the interest of time, this is how it works. Um, you have application based. So you, if you're building machine learning applications and you don't want to write code for machine learning, um, and you just want to be a consumer of machine learning, then you're probably you you want to use the APIs that already exist. So we've created APIs for vision, video intelligence, translation, natural language, speech, and text to speech. Now. Uh, if you if if you want to use the APIs, they are they they are already pre-trained APIs with large amounts of data. Um, but you could also use AutoML a AutoML on top of this, which means that you can bring your own data, and that's being utilized on top of the other data that that we already had to create vision and translation and these APIs. Um, and so now your your model becomes custom in nature because you brought your own, um, for example, uh, you want to identify specific rashes or types of things in images. Um, so vision API is already equipped to identify um, like skin and other components of it, but those rashes could be the examples that you offer in the AutoML vision uh, and create your custom model off of it. So that's just one example. And then if you're writing your own model code and, and using notebooks, um, then you also have options to create your own um, code and deploy it to run and train your models um, through the data science and machine learning tools that are on the platform. These are some of those um, icons for those services. I'm not going to go into details of that, but that's kind of how that works. Now, the next thing that comes in, in our architecture, back to our architecture, is monitoring, right? You want to monitor all of these services. And the way you do that is by using cloud operations. Now, operations has multiple different um, features. So you have monitoring where you can collect, analyze metrics and um, SLO alerts and those types of things. You could also have cloud logging, which is where all the logs from all the systems that you're using. So um, anything that you're using in this architecture, like GCE, GAE, CloudRun, databases, big table, all of them are sending logs to the cloud operations and logging. And you can look at all those logs. There's, there's trace, there's debugging, there's profiling. So there's a lot, lot of features in cloud operations that you can take advantage of to understand what's going on in your infrastructure and, and take actions on, um, on improving that. Then comes security. So obviously, we're not going to go into, there's a lot that can be covered in security. I'm going to cover these five uh, topics very briefly. So there's cloud identity and access management, which is response, which is the um, which is the piece that, that makes sure that you provide the right role to the right service or the right user in order to access a specific service. So um, in our use case, if I if I want my compute engine web server to only talk to or have access to my apps uh, application server, then 
you would create a service account for that compute engine to talk to that app server. And that's the only connection that it can have. It cannot talk to your database directly because that's not what it is supposed to do. So those are the, are, are the things that you, that you do using identity and access management. There's also key management. So all of these services in general and data across the platform is encrypted by default at rest and in transit, but you can also um, manage keys or bring your own keys to encrypt data at any of, at, at any of these uh, services, the ones that, that support the, that kind of encryption. Then you have um, security command center, which is where you can see everything from the security perspective. So it's basically like your canvas to understand security um, in your application, and if there's anything going wrong, it would flag that for you in Security Command Center. Um, there's also managed SSL certificates that you can use. You can have Google create those certificates for you and manage the, the SSL certificate, certificates and their life cycle um, for you so you don't have to worry about it. The HTTPS is handled or taken care of. Um, Cloud Armor, I'm going to go a little bit into the details of this one. Cloud Armor is enabled as, and you can think of Cloud Armor, um, it's basically first enabled at the load balancing layer, just like Cloud CDN, you enable Cloud Armor at the same layer. Um, it brings a lot of security at the layer, um, at the layer, from layer three to layer seven of the, um, of the OSI model. So from layer three perspective, you are, protected from sin floods, DNS amplifications, and those types of attacks at the, at the layer three and layer four DDoS attacks. Um, if you want to protect your application or do, don't or allow access control from a specific geography, like I don't want users from UK to access this site because it's not open in UK, you do that stuff in, you can create those rules in Cloud Armor as well. Uh, you can also do fine green rules at layer seven. So uh, things that you do in a web application firewall, that's kind of what this is, which is I want to protect against SQL injections or cross-site scripting, and I don't want users to go to slash admin of this URL. You do all of that through, um, through Cloud Armor as well. So there's lots of security benefits of using Cloud Armor and just in enabling that. You can also create your own rules if you wanted to. I'm not going into that, but that's kind of what this yellow piece here is, and you can pause and read that. All right, so developer tools, which is what we all are interested in. So if we are writing the code, we want to make sure that we only write the code and don't have to worry about some of the other things that go on in the CI CD world. So Cloud Shell and Cloud SDK are, um, are the tools that help us um, utilize the APIs within, um, within the infrastructure. So I want to create, say, Compute Engine instance using the API on the SDK, so you'd use Cloud SDK for that. You could also you do it in Cloud Shell. Now, some of these other things I'll show in this, this diagram here. Cloud Build is a tool that helps you um, basically build, test, and deploy your application. So it's like this one-stop shop for CI CD or fully managed CI CD pipeline in Google Cloud. So you write your code, you push it to, to Cloud Build, so you write the source code, push it to Cloud Build. The Cloud Build is going to check for vulnerabilities. It's going to build that that um, build your code, so uh, using Cloud Build.yaml, too much details there. <laughs> uh, but you, it'll build the code for you, and then just depending on what destination you want that code to be sent to, um, whether you want to send it to Cloud Run or Kubernetes Engine or Cloud Functions or App Engine, depending on where your application is supposed to go, it's going to deploy it there. That's kind of what Cloud Build does. It's managed CI CD platform. So check that out. And Cloud Code is really what you're using to, to, uh, to write your code so it can interface easily into Cloud Build. These are some of the resources that I have used to build this presentation and which you will find helpful. Um, so use these links. Uh, it's basically four words or less as a project um, that I'm helping Greg and I are partnering on this to, to um, bring you all the Google Cloud Platform products in, in defining them in four words or less. Um, a, a huge refresh of this is coming in the next week. So stay tuned for that. And um, 
follow us on GitHub for, for this as well. Same thing for GCP sketch notes. It's an ongoing series that I do. All the diagrams and the pictures that you are seeing throughout this presentation um, are part of this project that I have on GCP sketch notes. Um, on GitHub, go ahead, look at it. Um, and if you have feedback, if you want to share something um, or um, propose a topic, do send it to me. I create some of these things to help uh, demystify Google Cloud for you. Um, and it would be very helpful to hear what you think and what you what would what you would benefit from. I also have a YouTube channel where I uh, take the sketch notes and um, and create a video out of it to explain it. Um, so if you are interested in that, um, go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And if you have any other questions, even outside of this presentation, and you'd like to reach out to me. Um, please do so. I'm always happy to hear what you're thinking about if you have any questions on social channels. So I am very excited to, to hear from you and thank you so much.
Now, Tracy Lee will share a framework for creating inclusive development teams and tools you can use to enable for longevity and success of your teams. Welcome, Tracy. Hello, everyone. My name is Tracy Lee. You can follow me on Twitter at Lady Leet. I am the CEO of a consultancy called This.Labs. We love everything JavaScript. Um, so if you have any projects or want to come work with us, we are hiring all the time. And we just love working on fun projects as well. I'm also on the RxJS core team. I'm a Google developer expert for Angular as well. And I'm a Microsoft MVP. And I just love to do you know, fun things within the community. So hope to see you around. Today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is inclusive architectures and how to build this in terms of something called the PAM stack, which is basically this framework for developing uh, sustainable development teams. So if you look at PAM stack, it has these three pillars, this idea of process abstractions and mentorship. And, um, you know, a lot of development teams are always thinking to themselves, hey, why, why aren't all of our team members successful on our, on our teams, right? And a lot of times we kind of need to acknowledge the idea that, you know what, team members not being successful may not be their problem. It might actually be the fault of the teams, right? If you don't make inclusive decisions in your code base, or if you don't make good decisions about how to structure your team, that may actually be the reason for early failures of new team members onboarding onto your team. But again, these decisions, they affect everyone, not just new people or juniors. Uh, if you look at non-inclusivity and the idea of non-inclusivity, uh, this is why it hurts everyone. For example, if you don't have good onboarding documentation, right, then you're going to have to spend so much time explaining the same thing to every new person that joins the team. Knowledge is inconsistent. Every person really kind of needs to be senior to be able to jump in and learn how to swim. Individual excellence also ends up running teams. So, you know, you have these people who you just can't live without on the development team. People silo their experience. And then all of a sudden you have these hit by a bus fears. The idea that, hey, if this person left, what would we do? We wouldn't even know how to deploy. Right. And that is a really scary thing to do. And that is, you know, the basically the definition of having a non inclusive team. Also, complex code bases. If your code base deviates from the industry standard or things are more hand rolled, it's much more difficult for anybody to get productive immediately. But if you rely on standards and best practices, then you can help somebody get productive from day one. Also, if you don't have advancement, paths um, or mentorship, then you're not creating your next uh, senior developers or leaders within the organization. And that that kind of sucks for everyone as well. So going to the PAM stack, um, I want to show you how it actually helps you build a development team, a, a sustainable development team. And the first thing we can focus on is process. So if you think about different organizations, I'm going to read this through and you just tell me if this sounds familiar to you or not. Success in these organizations depends on the competence and heroics of the people in the organization and not on the use of proven processes. So if you feel like, oh man, we only have rock star developers and those are the only people that we can hire because those are the only ones that can work within our code base, or you feel overcommitted and you feel like things are being rushed, or you know, you look back at a project and you say, hey, why did it fail or succeed? And it's completely arbitrary. Or if a project always goes over schedule and you blow through the budget or nobody knows what they're supposed to do, right? Um, these are kind of the signs of an organization without process. If you have a good process, then all of a sudden there's clear expectations, teams are more engaged and cooperative, you don't have those single points of failure, so you don't have those hit by a bus failures, right? Because everyone knows what's going on and everything is documented, everything's backed up. There's also less stress during the crazy times, during releases, right? And if you have a way of working through conflicts, then it's reducing the power struggles within your team, which can get annoying. Um, one of the first things to do to kind of start implementing process and creating a more inclusive development team 
is start writing things down, creating plans, asking what needs to be done, who's going to do them, how should it be done, etc. And then just kind of start following through that process. Defining roles and responsibilities is also something that's really often overlooked. So you see here, we look at something, um, roles and responsibilities for a code review, right? You can see what the author has to do, the peer reviewer has to do, observers, and that way, everybody knows, okay, if somebody disagrees with X, what's going to happen, who prevails, et cetera, et cetera. And this makes it really healthy and much less stressful for a development team. Another super easy way to add process onto your team is just creating checklists. So, you know, we're all humans. We all, you know, <laughs> we can't keep everything in our heads. So this really reduces the error-prone way of humans. Um, it also helps new team members know what to do. And again, we always, you know, everybody gets busy and stressed out, right? And sometimes you forget things. But if you have a checklist, it makes it so much easier. You can have like a more relaxed day because you have it written down. Now let's talk about the next pillar, which is abstractions. Um, and, uh, you know, I just want to go ahead and acknowledge that web development is hard. You know, you, you, you learn the basics and then all of a sudden accessibility and responsive design, performance, security. Every single year, there's so much more to learn. And that definitely leads to JavaScript fatigue for everybody. Um, and, you know, even worse is that the complexity uh, and how complex web development is getting is a barrier to entry for our industry, right? Because every single time we define what it means to be a good, a de a good developer, things change. And then all of a sudden, you don't feel like you're a good developer. Well, the great part about uh, abstractions and the abstractions available to us is that there's tons of different things that can help. So one of them is frameworks, right? So when I was learning how to code, I was so happy because I could just build an Angular and Angular just spun everything up for me. I didn't have to set up a development environment. It was just done for me, right? And, you know, the great thing about frameworks as well is that it provides teams with all these out-of-the-box tools um, and, you know, they don't have to think twice about it, right? They have something to follow. CLIs as well are really amazing and something you should definitely be considering using if you're not already. But it's a great way to just spin up a project. Um, ha you have a zero config environment, out of the box performance. Um, most of the major frameworks have them. And all of these tools are actively maintained, which is amazing as well. So again, they just make it so much easier for you to work within a technology and do the things that are important, which is building features versus like setting everything up. TypeScript as well is so great to use. It's another great abstraction. Um, you know, TypeScript is awesome because it helps you understand the functionality and purpose of the code. And because it has stricter rules, that also means it comes with less bugs, which is awesome. Um, another thing is that there is better error handling. So getting to the root of the problem is much easier and faster. And your console has more descriptive errors to figure out what's wrong. So all of these things are just really great. And if you're not using TypeScript, I highly recommend you checking it out just for your own sanity in the future. Design systems. Implementing a design system is so great because it helps establish, again, a framework for you to be talking to all the different project owners and the stakeholders within a project, and it helps you scale your organization, right? If you have one overarching design system and maybe 10, 15 teams, um, you guys have you know, something that you've agreed upon and you're reducing the amount of stress it takes to like, you know, build another date picker, for example. The last thing to talk about is mentorship. And I love this pillar because it's so important to create a culture shift from within your organization. If you think about a proper culture of mentorship, imagine if you had it within your organization that said, you know what, you can't be promoted unless you nominate somebody to promote to be promoted into your role so you can actually be promoted. All of a sudden, the idea of the rock star developer and, hey, I'm going to do everything myself and get it done fades. And the idea of rock star mentors and helping other people grow into your position um, 
rises, which is, again, amazing. Uh, you know, mentorship obviously is very beneficial for mentees. It accelerates their growth, increases their confidence, increases communication skills. Um, you know, they feel invested in and valued. But even more importantly, well, I guess equally importantly, um, there are great benefits for companies like recruiting, for example, increasing developer productivity, reducing the knowledge silos, right? If everybody's talking about code, all of a sudden you don't have the hit by the bus factors anymore. It also creates a more positive, helpful, and collaborative team culture, increases loyalty, and a ton of other fun things. So, you know, mentorship can be a lot of different things and take a lot of different forms, um, you know, different different things that can happen. For example, our formal one-on-one -on -one sessions you might be familiar with, but also code reviews, right? Authors learning from the comments of their reviewers, reviewers learning new patterns that are important, uh, pair programming, right? Tech talks also are a great way to kind of foster mentorship within an organization. And also sometimes just opening up a chat channel and get, letting people talk about whatever it is in their day is really useful. So we talked about a lot of different things today, but um, they can basically be summarized up into process abstractions and mentorship. And if you like this and you're a junior on your team, you know, you can start asking for questions on the project. Um, you can document things, share it with others, ask for code reviews, do code reviews as well, even if it's with a senior developer's code, right? You're just helping create that culture of mentorship. And then if your team likes these ideas and the process, then you can actually ask for it to be formally incorporated, which is amazing, again, because you're actually being able to change the system. So I hope this was really helpful. Uh, you know, at this thought, we have apprentice programs and all these other really fun things. I love helping underrepresented folks in tech. Um, so, you know, I'm always happy to chat on Twitter at Lady Lee, or you can email me hi at this.co and hope y'all enjoyed.
Nareen will share her story of stepping outside the box and creating a collaborative learning environment that encourages engagement through innovative user experience design. Let's welcome Nareen. Hi everyone, I'm Nareen Hall and I'm very excited to be here. I'm a system professor at Champlain College and data science program director, as well as the founder and CEO of InSpace. Uh, I'm also the Google Developer Group Advocate, member of the Women Tech um, Group and Women in Data Science Groups. And uh, I love being part of lots of community groups and being active member of the community. I have started coding uh, when I was in seventh grade. And since then, I have been in love with the concept. I think one of the things that really got me started with coding is uh, the ability to control um, things in my computer and write programs that uh, can do anything I want to do. In some ways, it sort of became my creative uh, playground where I could create all sorts of things and uh, play with them. And since then, I you know, pursued a degree in computer science. I got master's and PhD in data science um, and really enjoy staying in academia. One of the things that were really interesting was that I always was interested in different professions and in different ways of connecting them. So I was interested both in math and statistics, but also in computer science and business side of things and really enjoyed like creative, fun ideas and entrepreneurship. And I found myself oftentimes in the intersection of academia and industry. And I couldn't really make up my mind. So I would sort of just go to industry and then go to academia, do some teaching. And uh, but I found that it was really fun to be able to be in a small teaching college where it was very agile and flexible and I could do a lot of innovation. There were no patent laws. So if I came up with something, obviously I didn't have to share with institutions. So that was really great. Um, and uh, one, of, uh, one of the things that I found was that it was really interesting to uh, connect with a lot of people. And as I started working more, uh, engaging more with community groups, like I started with Google developer groups and other groups, I found that it was very powerful to have the support of other people and just share ideas and encouragement with each other. And that was like really a key thing. And I want to share with you uh, some of the last project that we work on uh, sp specifically in space and how it came to be. And uh, really the power of finding the right people and how important that is for the success of each project. And throughout all projects that I've worked on, I would say that was probably one of the biggest ones. For example, last year, um, I got we got an NSF grant to work on studying the impact of climate change on biodiversity. And it was this massive collaboration project that happened because like the right people came together. And um, similarly, um, we started this uh, thing called machine learning for all, which uh, really the idea is, can we democratize machine learning so more people understand what it is uh, because it's it's everywhere in our devices and everything. So the ability to understand what's going on is so important, um, despite the fact if someone is like really into super math and like, you know, digging deep into it. And it was really cool or like, uh, you know, being able to collaborate with the right people, like sparking ideas. Um, so. In uh, last March, I was actually um, teaching a course in machine learning and, you know, it's a really fun interactive course. And when the pandemic started, we all kind of quickly uh, moved to virtual, um, you know, virtual setting. I was used to teaching really exciting courses, but uh, in historic buildings, but all of a sudden all that those vibrant classroom interactions didn't translate to my virtual environment the fun light bulb moments were replaced with awkward pauses and muted and sometimes black squares um, in the Zoom. And so it, at that point, I was, uh, you know, thinking about what, what's the next thing. And uh, I thought about quitting, but then I realized that I can't let the technology to stop uh, me from my passion of teaching. I just uh, need to find a way outside of the box. So the constraints of video conferencing calls were unbearable. Teamwork was impossible. Students were gone into separate rooms to brainstorm. And if they had any questions, they couldn't come back and talk to me until everyone was invited back. My job as a professor became boring. Uh, that's when I felt that the need to step outside of the box and try something different. And it was very hard to kind of think about it because I wasn't planning on writing a new platform or coming up with new video conferencing uh, solutions, but 
uh, what I had was just not working for me. So I connected with my longtime friend, uh, who's also, uh, she, we used to uh, do a lot of coding together. And, um, you know, we started thinking, what if we forget everything that's available right now and just think outside of the box and think about what it can be. And sometimes when you see the solution, it's very obvious and it's very intuitive. But until then, it's really hard to imagine it because we're so used to the way we're doing things that sometimes it's hard to imagine what things would look like otherwise. And um, so we came up with this um, idea of what if we actually had circles instead of squares that represent videos in, in sort of this video conferencing meeting and that each person could take their video and they can drag it around and um, and all of a sudden we were not stuck anymore and we could move around the space. Then uh, we came up with proximity based audio. This allowed us to step outside and have a private conversation, then join the group again, all while visually seeing the entire space and everyone. And just like that, the virtual social cues were born in a video conferencing meeting. The first moment when I got my video circle close to my friend and she looked at me and said, active listening, I miss that I have, um, in the virtual space. We just knew that it felt back to normal again. The hardest part is the phase where you have an idea and you have to trust it's going to be worthwhile to pursue it. But for us, it, it was easy. We couldn't help to uh, but keep coding. It was just fun because we worked always together and it was just really having this right mix of people come together and work on the project. And every little progress was so visual and interactive, it became addictive. So we kept going. So for, for days and, uh, you know, coding for quite a bit of while. And, you know, it was just this amazing moment of realizing we have built something that, you know, is really cool. So once we build a minimum working product, we actually, I sent it to a colleague uh, at the college and they just loved it. And they sent it to the other colleagues and it started spreading like wildfire in the college. And it was this really incredible moment when I realized someone was calling favors to be able to get into our beta version. And that was the moment we realized we built something that others wanted to uh, see as well. And the whole process really just happened because we were just having fun working together and we didn't realize that it was moving so fast and we were actually solving a problem that other people were having as well. And um, one of the things about the design is that it actually not about what it actually is. It's like sort of the implications of what it works. So for example, like being able to drag your video circle around means like people feel the freedom of movement. So we added this new dimension where people could move around and do things. And I think one of the key things there is like, what if you could create any kind of um, visual interface where you just don't have to think about what's already possible? And when I think about this, um, I, one of the things I noticed, so only five out of 700 programming languages were created by women. And I thought that's such an interesting statistic. Um, and I just couldn't help but think about what it would look like if that number was 350. Could it be that we would have different kinds of user interfaces, different kinds of programming languages, and our entire tech ecosystem could be, could be completely different. And uh, being in a computer science and data science majors, I often kind of wonder uh, what are the best ways to add diversity, right? To make it more equal. And like, perhaps like if we have more women in technology, then we have more of the tools build also that are more working for everyone. And uh, it would be more interesting to see where, what that would look like. So in, for us, it was really interesting to where we we're two women coding this and we we're basically just doing everything the way we wanted built for ourselves. And we wanted to have this beautiful circles with like this nice, uh, you know, bubbles that go around them when you're talking so you can see and everything was like very um in a way it was just built for us and like even so we we noticed very quickly that we were actually saying what is the feeling that we want to do and then we would reverse engineer that into a feature so like you want to be in an environment where you feel free and comfortable. So you build squares that are uh, circles that are moving around instead of sort of the squares that are stuck that we're usually kind of used to seeing like sort of in the Zoom environment. And, and then we thought, well, you kind of want to have one-on-one -on -one conversations because when you want to ask someone a question, you don't want 50 other people listening, potentially that can be intimidating for some people. And we thought, well, what if you just uh, step aside and have a conversation and you have this proximity-based audio to support that so you can have multiple conversations 
conversations in this one room. And, and then sort of we thought about, well, how, how about this? Like when you are in a video conferencing, sometimes like the uh, videos can be really big and that can be a little bit intimidating for some people and not so much for others. And uh, so we had this feature where you can zoom in and see people really big or you can zoom out and see the big picture. So every person gets to decide like what their experience should look like. So in other way, way people are in charge of their own experience and so they can feel more agency over their experience. So it, it was kind of really fun, like uh, being able to just brainstorm together and work together and just really build something that uh, felt like going from wh what do you want to feel and then coding that into what it looks like. Now, the part that I'm kind of, uh, and you know, we, we also created this teamwork idea where like we wanted people to be able to interact with each other and in teams without structure. And uh, so now people could go into these audio isolated rooms and have conversations. They can come back and talk to the teacher or, you know, teammates and go back and forth. And it was very open. So everybody can be in all the rooms. And sometimes like I would have someone in the, the check, check out in space and they were like, oh, can I move people around? And, you know, I usually just say, is that something you do in the physical space? And it just immediately clicks. So our philosophy was very simple. If something happens in physical world, then we bring it into the virtual world. Otherwise, we just don't do it. Like, for example, moving people around um, in the virtual space. So it was really fun to kind of create this uh, experience. And one thing I kind of want to share a little bit is this big transition going from being really a coder and a professor in data science to becoming the CEO of a company that grew really fast. We actually just, uh, we're at the moment 20 uh, employees and uh, we just finished the financing round. And all of these are things that I have never done before. I started a company uh, in grad school, but we haven't got that far. We basically just wrote some patents and, uh, you know, just build a product. And I was a CTO at the time. And for this one, it was a very different experience. And so every week it feels like I'm learning a new profession and then learning how to delegate it and find the right people to do it. And so, you know, initially it's like sort of learning the corporate, incorporating a company and learning what goes all into it, which is quite a bit, and then finding the right people who can do it. Uh, then learning sort of the financials and the CFO job and then finding people who can do that or how to manage a team. In this process, I realized how important it was for me to build community and be able to uh, connect with people outside of my profession. And uh, what happened is I started very quickly connecting with folks that I met through G GDG groups and other groups and other community um, chapters that we have been doing here. And uh, because everybody was virtual, it was actually very uh, easy to connect with people. And uh, very quickly, I was able to find folks who were really good at different things and who could advise me and help me to kind of learn what it's like to take that big step and sort of become the CEO of a company. And uh, yeah, so it really, it just came down to like being able to create a network, have a support network and have people who are really competent and people who I've known for a long time to uh, be able to work uh, to work with. And so this this networking part uh, is 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 really uh, is really critical in like building, um, you know, the professions of the future. All right. And I want to share uh, this other um, thing here. So when building a product, sometimes it can be really hard to rapidly innovate. And sometimes like, you know, we had this idea that was very innovative where like you basically have video circles moving around, there's proximity based audio, etc. But then what happened is as we started showing this to other educators, they immediately turned our meetings into brainstorming sessions and they're like, whoa, what if you could also do this other thing? And, and they started immediately coming up with different features. So what we did at this point, we literally started taking those ideas and immediately putting it into the platform. Like a week later, they will see their ideas come to life. And it was like really exciting. And uh, we started naming those features after educators who came up with the concept and created this really cool culture where people would get this newsletter saying, oh, check this out. Ken from MIT came up with this new concept where when you drag your circle close to the stage area, it gets larger so people can see you better. You can raise your hand. And, you know, it's another way of sort of indicating that you're about to say something. And then other uh, professors started coming up with sort of different ways they can run their classroom now that they have sort of this interactivity where they would have students in a circle and people who want to talk, they would come forward. So 
uh, if two people came forward together, instead of interrupting each other and having this awkward moment, they could see sort of visually who was first and the other person would go back and talk. And um, very quickly, we realized like how cool it is to have like an entire community come around a platform. And in a way, we sort of crowdsourced the idea of the product and let educators to come up with the concept. And it was really powerful to have to have the ability to do this. And some of that came from the the fact that I was before part of the community and uh, community groups and uh, leading leading those uh, groups. And this is an example that one of our uh, professors shared. So this is a cl music class, and as you can see, the the background is like really a stage, and everybody's just gathered up around the piano. It's like this really nice community feel of. Uh, running classes that are uh, that feel a little bit more like uh, you know getting together in a physical space. Uh, this is like you know traveling different places and running classes in different you know areas like Hawaii in this case. And uh, this is actually from Bobson College. One of our uh, professors just posted uh, how how their class feels like when they're doing this. And you know you can just travel to your actual classroom. Um, yeah, so this is all I wanted to share. So I wanted to share the pr product that we came up with and the journey and how we got here. And I really want to encourage everyone to start early to collaborate with people and find the local groups that are around you, get together. And especially with now everything being virtual, there's so many really exciting get togethers that are happening. Uh, I think it's it's a really important piece of successful projects to be able to collaborate and build your network early and have people that you can go to and ask questions when you're trying to build something exciting and they, they should be able to help you. All right. Thank you everyone for having me.
Soju, Duke, for our final session covering the ending possibilities of AI, how it is used for social good, the social impact it currently has on society, potential reasons for bias, and how to incorporate a responsible framework in AI algorithms. Let's welcome Toju for her talk. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Toju Duke. I'm a responsible AI program manager at Google, and I've been in Google for seven years. I'm currently based in Dublin. I'm here to talk to you today about artificial intelligence, and I've given it a very nice fancy title, Breaking Down Artificial Intelligence, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. So what we're gonna take out from today's session is really the importance of AI, how fantastic it is, and how important it is to the world's problems today. But I'll also cover the things that we need to be aware of, the issues and the challenges that currently face artificial intelligence or AI today, and the work that Google is doing um, to prevent and to circumvent some of these problems. I'm going to begin by saying um, stories about three different people from three different social economic backgrounds, ethnicities, ages, cultures, and geographical locations. Let's start with Rose. Rose is a mother. Um, age 35 years old. She's a mother to a young little boy called Brendan, who is three years old. Rose is a, also a single mother. She's based in Manhattan in the US. Rose decided to take six months off um, for maternity leave when she gave birth to Brendan because she wanted to be there for her little baby. Um, in so doing, Rose was made redundant as well, so she lost her job. After six months, Rose decided to extend her maternity leave by three months because she still felt that she needed some more time at home to spend with her child and recover and prepare herself mentally and physically for work. So Rose extended it to nine months. Once the nine month period was up, Rose started applying for various jobs. I must add as well that Rose has 10 years experience as a software engineer and has worked across different companies before she gave birth to Brenda. Rose applied for jobs for two full years without getting a single job. Rose did not understand what was going on. She started doubting herself. She started wondering if the brain cells have been affected by her pregnancy that she had. She needed the money to pay her bills and to take care of Brendan. And she was going down this rabbit hole of depression because she couldn't understand why based on her experience and the fact that she had a good job before she gave birth to Brendan, why she couldn't find a job. And, you know, during the course of Rose's job hunts, we have amazing research scientists in the world today who actually discovered that most recruitment software using AI technologies are biased towards women. And they favor male resumes over female resumes. Aha. So this was the problem. There was nothing wrong with Rose, nothing wrong with her educational background or her work experience or her brain cells after giving birth to beautiful and handsome young Brendan. The problem was the software that were being applied to job applications. And this is one major problem facing artificial intelligence in the world today. It's rooted in inherent bias based on the data that it's been built on. And we have the likes of people like Rose who are victims of such software and technologies. And there's no amount of money or work that could be done that will gain Rose those months that she lost. 24 full months of searching for jobs and losing her self-esteem. She needs to build everything back. And the question is, what if research didn't uncover these biases and these problems with the software? And how many different companies have actually adopted and employed these different algorithms on recruitment that are rooted towards the female gender as opposed to men? Let's move over to Greg. Greg is a young man, he's based in Philadelphia. He's 27 years old, a dad with two kids. 
Greg is also a shop assistant working for one of the well-known retail stores in the US. Greg does not have any criminal record. He grew up in a very nice home with a good background. His parents were educated. And, you know, his family has been okay. He has no issues. He's been living the life as we call it today. One day Greg comes back from work after a very long tedious day at work where he was handling very, you know, different customers and some are a bit problematic. And he's just about to get into his house where, when he's stopped by some policemen. And immediately they put him in handcuffs and they take him to the police station and he's been arrested. Greg is confused. He has no idea what's going on. His wife watched through the window of her house along with his two kids, seeing their dad arrested right in front of their eyes. And as, well, as you know, stories will have it. And after a lot of investigations were made, it was found that Red, Greg was wrongfully accused for a crime he did not commit because facial recognition software did not identify his face as someone on the criminal record. And according to facial recognition software today, especially being employed by a lot of criminal justice systems, they have problems recognizing people from African or black descent. And there's so many countless stories like Greg happening in the world today. Let's move over to Paul and Kim. Paul is age 85, Kim is age 80. They're beautiful grandparents to 12 different grandkids and they have four kids all together. Paul and Kim during the summer decided to take a holiday. This was all before the pandemic happened. Let's bear that in mind. Um, Paul and Kim decided to take a holiday to Spain. They were tired of going to Hawaii every year and they said, oh, we're just gonna take a very nice long holiday to Europe and let's see how, how we can get some European sunshine this year. And they go off to Spain. On the third day of vacation, they got a frantic call from one of the grandkids and they were told that their house has been robbed. All the valuable possessions have been taken. This is a house that they've lived in for the past 50 years. They were heartbroken. And what could have led to this? Apparently, Paul and Kim used social media. And on social media, they had posted that they were traveling. But along the line, their data had been sold out to third party users who did not secure the data properly. And in so doing, these systems were attacked, there was not security, and their privacy was impended. These are stories that are happening today. These are stories that could happen today. These are all the effects of artificial intelligence. So let me get off the deep, dark, gross, gory side of AI, and let's look at exactly what AI means so that we're all on the same page. Put it in a nutshell, it's all about intelligence in machines. Um, looking at intelligence in machines that act like humans. So being able to make human intelligent decisions. And the, the, the term AI was coined in 1956 by some scientists who decided to, to have a conference to start, kick off this whole trend of artificial intelligence. AI is in literally everything, every form of technology that we see today, literally. I call it the oxygen of tech. It's in your smartphones today. If you pick it up and you have to do a face ID on your Apple phone, for instance, or your Samsung phone, or even your Google Pixel, that's using AI. Or even just typing on Google search where you're searching for something and you see the different predictive text that comes up, that's using AI. And we'll talk about Google Nest or Alexa or Echo or any other device today that uses some form of speech recognition or face recognition or predictability that is meant to help you towards, you know, while you're using these different technological systems or devices, many times they are using artificial intelligence called AI. We've, we've, we have various versions of AI, you know, AI has conquered a lot of hoops, a lot of things that research scientists couldn't predict. And they said, it is impossible for a, ma a machine to beat a man in a game of chess. Absolutely impossible. 
And most of the scientists that made the statement are alive today to actually see that happen. AI has bit men in chess. We have deep minds alpha goal um, that bit, you know, the worldwide, sorry, deep minds um, AI system that bit the worldwide alpha goal champion a few years ago. We have emotionally intelligent chatbots. We have AI that is helping to predict natural disasters, you know, actually even helping with COVID-19 today in, in, in terms of contact tracing, understanding what's happening in the world today, in, in the vaccines and everything else. AI is doing a lot of things, right? We have music that is being composed by artificial intelligence. Like it's sometimes bizarre, but it is happy that it, and it is real. And I think it's really important for everybody to know the use cases of AI. You know, as a developer and as a woman in tech, don't feel that because you're not working on machine learning, for instance, you don't you don't want to care about machine learning. You don't want to know about AI. It's there. It's for those fancy people who like those cool things. No, I think it's really important to know exactly what it is. You can decide if you want to go into that area or not, but it's important to know what's happening in the world today with AI. What about the business and the market? And why is there such a big buzz in AI? I mean, in, in the AI world, you know, there's been lots of terms about the AI winters and the AI spring and the AI, you know, winters again, and they're forecasting that we're going to go into another AI winter. In terms of business, it's forecasted to hit $126 billion by 2025. Well, that means we're predicting about 126% growth over four years. People are investing in, in AI. So it is important, not just to everyone who lives in the world today, but to investors and businesses and organizations and companies. A lot of tech companies are verging into AI. And if they're not doing it now, they have plans to go into it. So it is, again, AI is important. Pay more attention to it. So let's look at the good sides of AI because I've given you the very gory, dirty details, you know, started off and uh, I've, I've done this in a lot of talks and I've got a lot of, a lot of questions about, about why is AI still being used today if it's this terrible? And I always say, hold your horses, don't rush it. It's really not that bad. It is bad, right? It has the potential to be dangerous, but the potential it has to serve good as well and to serve humanity is pretty much high. And that's why I get excited about AI. So let, let's look at a few examples of AI for social good and what Google has actually done on AI for social good. Um, Google is a company that, you know, we want to make sure we make the world's um, information available to everyone, but not just that. We want to help solve humanity's problems as much as we can. So Google right now is supporting a lot of companies who are helping towards COVID-19 data analysis. And for example, one of the things that some of these companies are doing is trying to understand the effects the current virus and the current pandemic is having, ha having on vulnerable communities, right? On, on different ethnicities and cultures and age groups. What exactly is the impact? And also on the, on the healthcare workers, you know, what's the impact of this pandemic? on their work and their mental health. And there's a lot of work being done there. We, we had Google and Apple very recently to work you know, on the contact tracing app just to help towards this. And AI is still being employed. Is the main technology being employed in all these projects. These are projects that I don't need to tell you about the pandemic. You, we're all in the midst of it, right? This is, not, this is not a history talk. This is a talk of today. And we know how important to, to make advancements towards analyzing and understanding what the impact is, is on you know humanity and on different groups and also towards vaccines and just bringing an end to this pandemic and google is right in the middle of this so this is one of the things that ai is doing that is actually a great benefit to humanity google google tends to do impact challenge um competitions every year or every two years um where there's a large sum of money that will be donated to companies who can actually come up with good solutions to human problems. And this year, we have about 20 organizations that are currently part of Google's Impact Challenge. Um, I'm just highlighting the first four, but you can go on Google's um, website for social good and you can read a little bit more. But I feel these things that these organizations are doing are really important and they're critical to solving the world's problems today. So let's start off with Columbia University. 
they're actually working on an AI technology to build models, right? So that it can actually um, help optimize first responder responses so that they can respond a bit more quickly to about 1.7 million emergencies that they're facing today. That's AI being used towards something really positive to help humanity. Now, the second example, um, they are actually working to predict landslide disasters and help with location and timing and be able to understand what the impacted areas would be if there is a disaster, a natural disaster and help minimize the impact of these natural disasters. And especially if you live in the US and in some other parts of the world as well, you know how important it is. If we can predict some natural disasters, how much lives will be saved, how much properties wouldn't be lost and the impact it can have on the economy as well. So these are important things that AI is doing. Um, and you know, I can go on and on and on. The other two, uh, one is, is using AI to sift through a lot of cases on human, on human rights and helping humans, human rights lawyers. And the other one is helping um, using natural language processors, which is a type of AI to help counselors understand the capacities of, of queries that are coming through um, and help them you know optimize these queries and better be, be better prepared to help people who need counseling so again I, I can't stress it enough AI is not the biggest evil in the world it's actually a great good and it can contribute to great good in today's um, society or in human society today um, so let me give you a video of what AI is doing for this gentleman here. Google has very good general speech recognition, but if you do not sound as most of people, it will not understand you. No one's ever collected large data sets of people whose speech is hard for others to understand. People who have multiple sclerosis for deaf, who had stroke, who stutter. They're not used in training the speech recognition models. I mean, the game is, is to record things today. and then have it recognize things that you say that aren't in the training set. Dimitri recorded 15,000 phrases. It wasn't obvious that this was going to work. He just sat there and he kept recording. We need to make all voice interactive devices be able to understand any person who speak to them. You can see that it's possible to make a speech recognizer to work for Dimitri. It should be possible to make it work for many people, even people who can't speak because they've lost the ability to speak. The work that Shenxing has done on you know, voice utterances mm -hmm. from sounds alone, you can communicate. But there might be other ways of communicating. Most people with ALS end up using an on-screen keyboard and having to type each individual letter with their eyes. For me, communicating is slow. Steve might crack a joke, and it's related to something that happened you know, a few minutes ago. The idea is to create a tool so that Steve yes. can train machine learning models himself no. to understand his facial expressions. <laughs> To be able to laugh, to be able to cheer, to be able to boo. Things that seem maybe superfluous, but actually are so core to being human. I still think this is only the tip of the iceberg. We're not even scratching the surface yet of what is possible. We can get speech recognizers to work with small numbers of people who will learn lessons, which we can then combine to build something that really works for everyone. To understand and be understood the absolute unbelievable. I hope you're smiling as I am. That was a very touching video, but it just shows the amazing impact that AI can have in human lives, especially people who are suffering some form of disability or the other. Moving on. So I know I've touched a little bit on, on the different AI challenges and I'll probably just 
you know, go through them again in a different format, slightly different format, so that we're quite aware of what we're facing today when it comes to AI. You've seen the good sides of AI now, the amazing impact it can have on humanity today and how much we actually need AI um, today to solve some of the world's problems we're facing, even in the current pandemic. Um, but it's kind of important to know as, as well what current challenges we have in AI, which you've already heard a little bit um, at the start of this presentation. So back to Rose and Brendan and the beautiful story of Rose and Brendan, not quite beautiful, um, but we've heard the challenges that she's gone through due to AI. And you're probably wondering, why is that? Why are the AI systems spitting out bias right, left and center? Why is it being discriminatory to people? And is, is this someone's intention? Is someone actually just feeding it with, with biases as well? And there's so many reasons why um, there are biases in AI. I'm just gonna touch up on a few. One is something we call the ground truth. So AI is built on data. Most of this data is labeled. And most of the people, most of the forms of labeling this data, some of the forms is from human races. People labeling it because it's, it's been proven to be the most accurate form of, of labeling data. Now, the problem with that is, you know, a human being, someone from Asia, for instance, who is doing the labeling, could see a woman with curly hair and just decides to phrase it as untidy hair, woman with untidy hair. And that would lead into this data and this AI system being fed with such data as seeing a woman with curly hair and tag tagging it or labeling it as untidy hair. That's a correct problem we have today. Um, I wouldn't say that was intentional. It wasn't like, you know, the person decided to just label or whoever, all the different races, human races that we have today are actually intentionally mislabeling um, um, the data, data sets. No, it's based on their understanding. It's based on the different cultures and where they're currently located and what they actually see somebody else as. But these are human biases that are already inherent in us today. And unfortunately, because AI systems are still being built by humans and the teams are, are still being built by, you know, are, are made up of humans, what we have is what we're given to it. Garbage in, garbage out, as, as the saying goes. So that's one of the issues that we have. Sometimes as well, more, in many cases, in all cases, AI systems are unexplainable. It's hard to, to, to break it down and say, why did this AI system arrive at the decision it made? It's really, really difficult. And that's another problem that is affecting our AI technologies today. In Greg's case, the question is, you know, why are facial recognition systems not recognizing um, people from African and, and Black descents? Again, you know, we've talked about the, the, the human races, but as well, these um, data sets are not very inclusive. They're not showing everyone in society. They're not showing, they're not fully representing everyone in the world. Many times they're skewed to one particular part of the world, especially in the US, because most of these data sets are, are built in the US. And most of the data is from, from the US. And sometimes, most cases, it's not from diverse populations and diverse gender and underrepresented groups. And the problem with that is that these AI systems are now built and whatever they're built on, that's what they're gonna spew out as the output. Again, they lack transparency, they lack um, explainability. Um, deep neural networks, they develop like a black box. You know, once that AI system is, is, is taught machine learning, either supervised or unsupervised, and it starts developing its own output and making its own decisions, at that stage, it's very hard even for the developer to understand why that AI system arrived at the decision that it arrived at, because everything is now convoluted in numerous neural, neural networks, and it's hard to explain. In Paul and Kim's case, that AI system that had the data was not robust enough. They didn't have security, enough security measures in place. And even on safeguards and privacy, they probably were lacking. And that's how people, hackers, were able to hack into the system and sell their data off and they got attacked. So it's another problem. AI systems are very susceptible to adversarial attacks. They can easily be fooled um, to, you know, an AI system could be trained that an image is a dog, but it can easily be fooled to think that it's actually a stop sign. 
Um, and it's really important that safeguards are put in place when people are building AI systems. Right, so I've gone through the good, the bad, um, and the ugly, and let's think about, you know, what are the potential solutions that, that are being done today to address these problems? Because we're now aware, a lot of people are aware, a lot of tech companies are aware, Google is aware of this problem. And there's a lot of work being done now to solve this problem. So all hope is not lost, you know, it's not the end of the world. AI is not gonna take over our lives and just knock us all off. There's lots of work being done and that's where responsible AI comes into play. And the, and the onus is on every tech company, every person, including you that is listening, Anything that you create, think about creating it in an ethical and in a responsible way. Thinking about the output and the impact and the outcome of how it could affect different people in society. So let's go through how Google narrates um, and sees responsible AI today. So we have it in about six different slots. We've got fairness, where in, in Rose's and, and Greg's case, the AI systems were not fair towards towards their gender and towards their race. We've got privacy in Paul and Kim's case where you know the systems were not protecting their privacy. We've got interpretability or explainability where as I've mentioned before, it needs to be explainable. Someone needs to understand why that AI system arrived at the decision that it made. Robustness, again, it has to be secure and strong enough to, to prevent all forms of attacks. Transparency, it has to be transparent. We have to be able to understand, to see how that model works. You know, what are the different components in that model that, that, that was built by the tech company or, you know, by that organization and security, um, tying in, which ties in very well with robustness as well. Um, so I'll cover some tools and techniques that we've already done in Google. One is data model cards, um, and these are all available for free, open source. Um, and this data model cards covers transparency. So it's one tool that has been designed to address the transparent issue that we have. And it looks at different elements of toxic, toxicity that is in the, in the models. Um, and these are important ways of you know, evaluating your fairness. It shows how fair these um, models are and it allows you to document you know, put in the actual different um, ranges and models and, you know, systems and dimensions of your models. I mentioned before, it's open source. Um, and you can go read it up, just Google, um, Google data cards and model cards and you'll be able to get the information. Most of it sits on, on the TensorFlow um, website. Model cards, um, very similar to data cards and data transparency. It's addressing the transparency issue. Um, these two data cards and model cards are addressing specifically been developed to address transparency issues. And again, it looks at fairness as well. So this is great. It's great to see that, you know, companies and Google and other companies as well, because Google is not the only one in this space and other companies as well have developed tools to help towards this. But it's great to see that, you know, there's more awareness of the challenges facing um, artificial intelligence, although, you know, most of the awareness comes from the great work from research scientists where they actually just detect and discover and make some noise about it and then people start working on it. But it's great to see that we're making some very, very good advancements in this in this area. We have open data sets. Um, we've realized that if we have open data sets, it will be, it will most likely be representative and more fair because we will have people from different areas of the world, different countries and underrepresented groups actually you know, contributes to these data sets. We also have the what if tool. Um, the what if tool is helped to, is, is actually created to help you analyze the performance of your models. And it's also a tool that has been geared towards responsible AI. Um, and the moment you're able to like investigate your models and your model pipeline and why it's arriving at these different decisions and just understanding and breaking it down a little bit more, it helps towards making sure that, you know, your AI systems and models are more responsible. We also have another tool called Fairness Indicators and it just gives so many different elements on the different fairness metrics um, that your model has or doesn't have, but it gives you some more visibility on these different models that you have to see if they're actually a bit more ethical and a bit more responsible um, as they should be. 
there's lots of work being done in, in, the, in the background with Google. Um, we're doing a lot of work on privacy and robustness and security and on explainability or interpret interpretability. Um, so have no fear. Um, work is being done today, but now the question is, is down to you, right? You have, you've seen a problem, and I always believe that human beings are meant to solve a problem, right? If we have a human problem, it's always a human being that is meant to solve it, not, not a machine or not something else, not an animal, it will be a human being. So the question to you, and you know, to align with the theme of the session of, of this event, courage to create, I have a big question for you. What have you decided to create? And do not think that, oh, I'm not an ML developer, I'm not an ML engineer, this question is not for me, no, it's for you. Whatever you do today in whatever um, function you are, you still have the ability to create. You do not even need to be an engineer to create anything. And when I say create, I'm not talking about inventions. It doesn't just have to stick to inventing a software. It could be creating a project that will lead to another project. But the onus is on you to determine and to decide that I'm committed to contribute to some of the problems facing the world today. And it might not be the biggest of problems. It might be a problem facing that your organization is facing today, what you can solve. And I have another question, which still relates to the first question. Are you committed to solve the problems facing technology today? With the skill sets that you have and the educational background that has led you to where you are, and that's why you attended this event today, what have you committed to solve? And if you haven't, it's not too late. Think of a problem that you can solve. And if you don't know what the problems are, then go do some investigations. Check out what problem. And something I always say, whatever annoys you the most, whatever angers you the most, a problem that exists today that just makes you infuriated when you hear about it, many times, that's a problem that you're called to solve. The moment I heard about bias in AI systems and how it can drive further systemic injustice and discrimination, even while we're still fighting this problem today, boy, I got annoyed. I got so annoyed, I was like, I don't know anything about this as I should, but I'm gonna speak about it and I'm gonna keep on speaking about it so everyone understands the problems that we're facing today and are committed towards the solution. Even if it's just raising a collective voice to your government and saying, have some more regulations in place towards privacy. That's one thing that we could committed to do. So I'm gonna end up on this note. By applying courage, let's all contribute to one or two or three or four. And if you wanna make it 20 problems, that's fine. But let's all contribute to solving humanity's problems that we're facing today. Thank you. Thank you for all of the speakers as we are all in the main track. Now, we would like to remind you that we launched the application for the first ever Women Developers Academy for North America today. The Women Developers Academy, or we call it WDA, is a training program for women developers designed to build the skills and confidence to contribute to the community through public speaking, presentations, and more. Hosted over four weeks, the program combines virtual workshops and mentoring sessions where participants will walk away with a complete presentation you could give at a virtual summit, just like this one. If you're a developer and interested in taking your technical presentation and public speaking skills to the next level, this program is for you. Applications close on Sunday, March 28th, so don't miss out and apply today at the link you see on the screen. With that said, let's wrap the day up. Thank you everyone for tuning in today. Join us again tomorrow with more speakers and don't forget to give us feedback from the link on the screen. Remember, we have great raffle prizes that you can win upon completion. All right, then we'll see you tomorrow.